Hello and welcome everybody to the latest edition of the Buy Round interview show. Now, well, today, um, a man that needs no introduction. I hate it when people say that. Yeah, because uh, it's a well, <laughs> means, but you know, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give him one anyway. Uh, yeah, arguably um, one of our game's most uh, decorated and influential people, both mm. both on and off the field. Uh, none other than the face of the game. Maddie Johns. Thank you, Jimmy. Great to have you on. Um, one of the things I was going to describe you as um, mm. in your introduction was somebody that's universally liked, which mm. is... Got, I mean, you, mm. you, you're not... You, you don't feel... I, I think sometimes, Jimmy, um, you need to have... Uh, enemies are not the right word, but I think if you go and you're universally liked... Mm. I mean, this you'd think somewhere in the world there'd still be people who don't like Dolly Parton. <laughs> so people you know, she's just a big pair of tits. <laughs> so you just so I think you you have to have people that don't like you or mm. don't or don't like what you're about. Otherwise, I sort of get the feeling that you're a bit of a fake. Yeah, but mm. wh wh why would somebody like dislike you? Because you you're so popular on TV. Mm. You. You played. Do you think maybe the fact that you played at Newcastle helped? Like yes. you don't have a natural enemy. Yeah, I think Newcastle's a club that a lot of people's second favourite side, mm. or certainly were. Mm. And the style of football we played. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, um, Jimmy. I, I, I don't know. You know, maybe people don't like me because I laugh at my own jokes a lot. Um, I don't. I, I, uh, I might have a sense of humour that's not really their go. Sometimes I might be too forthright about their team, so on and so forth. So there's got to be people out there. Send us an email. Yeah. Or fax. <laughs> <laughs> but you speak. You speak a lot of sense. So, so you, you're never the type of person to just um, make a point for the sake of making a point, or mm. go chasing a, a headline, or mm. cri be critical of someone for, for no apparently reason. And it's always an informed opinion, yeah. if that makes sense. Yes. Like, so I I think that's why it's difficult to argue against mm. you because you come with evidence. Yeah, I think that's an important thing, um, Jimmy, is that is, if you come with evidence and you can explain something strategically, then they know it's not personal. Mm. That makes sense. And I, I know it's very hard to, to at times not take things personally when you're a player. The natural tendency is to take it personally, or that someone will take it uh, take it personally for you. Jimmy, did you hear what Maddie had to say about you? You know, and they'll, they'll you know, they'll put it in a different context to where to the way you want to talk about it. Or a coach will say, "Mate, I need a big one from Jimmy here. Did you see what Maddie said about him? I'll just give it to him second hand around." I've had a few of those where people have have rung me and gone, you know, ask me about. Oh, you know, mate, what did you say? And I said, mate, I said this. And they said, no, you didn't. You said that. I said, who told you that? I said, I don't know, coach. Mm. So, okay, no so your words get twisted yeah. or taken out of context and I, and as, I can, as yeah. motivation because you, you, do, you are on a pedestal within the game. So there may be an aspiring um, player that wants to impress someone like you because I think you're narcissistic if you are, well, I don't care what they've got to say. Yeah. Well, maybe you should. Yeah. And most people do. Yes. Well, most people do. People, I think anyone who says, I don't give a fuck what anyone thinks, means they do. Mm. To actually not care what people think or, or, how could I say, to not be offended or not be dented by what people want to say, I think it's more of a discipline than it is part of your makeup, natural makeup. Because mm. I think part of the human condition really is to worry what people say and what people think about you. And especially we are geared towards negative comments. Like yes. there's there's research out there that says if you look on and, – and things like social media, it's not how we naturally communicate anyway. Mm. Um, I don't it, – it's not how we sometimes really feel. Like no. it's not something we'd say to people. No, it's usually you, stuff that people back in my day, you'd write on the back of a toilet door something nasty about mm. someone. You wouldn't you wouldn't have it on Twitter. Call this number. Yeah, yeah call this yeah. number for a good time. <laughs> call Seabass. <laughs> 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 no, it, but it, but it's true though. We we are we, we we take on board 
uh, criticism and negative comments more than positive comments. Mm. And it, it is an interesting world that we live in because you know there could be 10 people praising you on social media, mm. but one comment about an interview, a, a show, a performance, you hold on to that. Mm. But, but also, it, we've gone a little bit off track here, but also like whose who's opinion really matters? Like deep mm. down, I think there's a, there's a bit in there with them, um, with the current player and, and well, what, mm. like am I playing the game to impress Matthew Johns? Um, well, it, it's I, I don't know because I'm, yeah. I'm contradicting myself there because I no. should care what you think, but it's mm. not why I'm doing it. Well, that's why I think sometimes when you, when you have a, whether you're on a panel and, and or to, it's your job to critique, whether that be good, bad, or something needs to be adjusted. That, that's your, it's our job to do that, Jimmy. So for that reason, I actually think social media is counteractive to you giving your own honest opinion because I think sometimes what happens with, you know, whether it be former players or journalists, you can actually see sometimes what social media and the want, what actually starts to happen is the want to impress the people on social media, which you then you you're really never going to do. The ones mm. that like you like it. And that's the reason why I've never been on social media. I mean, wife does a little bit of stuff for me on Instagram or my sons do now, uh, but I've never been on Twitter. I've never been on Facebook. And as I've said to people before, I actually don't own a computer. And so really if people are trying to sway my opinion via social media, um, they're wasting their time so I don't see it. I'm not, I'm not on it. But you know what I mean, Jimmy? It's very easy, I could imagine, to be a journalist and go, oh, I feel like I've just written the story of my life and then to jump on and people are just absolutely climbing India and then you go, well, okay. <laughs> the natural thing will be, well, what do they want? Yeah. When you're, you're not really, yeah, that makes sense. Appease the masses. Mm. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting that and how that influences how we, uh, how we think are we formalise an opinion, which I'm really interested mm. to see. Which then, what, Jimmy, you take to the next step, mm. I suppose, and we talk about the other side of the fence about um, then, okay, your job is to critique and you're critique, uh, critiquing athletes and how people's opinion of us, whether it be on social media, can influence what we say. Well, imagine the impact on these young players having a look – on Twitter, and they think to themselves, and hey, look, this, this is a normal human condition. Jeez, I'll tell you what, I was good tonight. I'll just, I'll just open it up and have a bit of a look, and they get bombarded. But I hate not the impact that must have on players. Mm. Um, it's interesting that you, you speak about not having a computer, not having social media, um, because there is more to the man than um, the TV personality, the... Mm. the the former professional athlete that won a competition with his home club. Um, there's the love of music, mm. uh, the love of travel. Yep. Um, the like I say that the, the different side not being part. Uh, I guess you could you could argue with the no computer, no social media, but a counterculture mm. within you. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, probably. My dad was um, sort of come from a long line of coal miners, and. Uh, and miners are generally union-minded, and little probably that left side, um, left side of the brain a little bit as far as that's concerned. Yeah, I, but Jimmy, you know, I I think a lot of things, particularly the computer, it'll gi it does give me anxiety sometimes, because I have an over reliance on then other people, like my wife. So I've just, you know, I've well, just actually, well, technically, yeah. don't you have a computer in your phone? I suppose I, I do. I just never really use it, although I've started to. What used to really give me panic attacks is when I was away from my wife. So what I used to have to do, I'd write my article, which I still do. I write it longhand because of the fact that I think just the motions of your brain work better when I'm writing. But then I had As to, opposed to typing. Yeah. And then I, but then I had to get it into the computer and I didn't really know how to operate computer properly. <laughs> mm. This is really I'm incriminating myself here, uh, but then typing in would have taken me a year, so I used to have to dictate to Trish. Ah, yeah. not dictate to uh, voice to text. Now I've just realised how to do that. So that that's the great thing about it. Like uh, my editor at the uh, Telegraph, Adam Mobs, I said, mate, listen, is there a problem if I actually if I send you my articles via text 
and speak into it. And he goes, oh, okay, no problem. He didn't sound convinced, mm. but that's how, that's my way of sort of trying to take a little bit of pressure off my wife and mm. my sort of step into um, into technology. Mm. But as far as uh, being on social media and all that sort of stuff, Jimmy, I'm just not that handy. Mm. And uh, and there was a one one point where Trish set up the Instagram, and bugger me, what I'm fi- what I found in that week was I was on it all the time. Highly addictive. Yeah. Well, it's even um, doom scrolling. Mm-hmm. The design to keep you engaged. So now, uh, I was listening to somebody talk about this. So, uh, and it's the same with um, streaming services. So, there used to be, you'd watch a, you'd watch a show, you had to exit and then play the next episode. But now they start to play the next episode for you yeah, to keep that's engagement. Right. And it's the same with Instagram. The reel or whatever will finish and the next one will begin. So yeah. you have to choose to exit. Yeah, right. You don't have to, you don't, they take away that choice to carry on. Yeah. It used to be, you have to choose to continue mm. versus now you have to choose to leave. Well, that's and there's a big difference. And, they, a, caught, yeah. and they, they caught onto it and one did it and even though you could argue, it's they know it's not a good thing, mm. but because everybody else is doing it, that's their justification. Well, it's interesting, Jimmy. Again, so something about the smart business model of what people are like. Because years ago, I used to go uh, used to go to this gym. It was one of the most populous gyms in Sydney, as you can tell. Yes. And um, anyway, I was talking to him, like I said, how many how many members? Do you- do you have here? And he said, it's just, he said, it's probably almost the most profitable uh, gym we've got in Australia of this chain. I said, oh, how many, how many members? He said, I think we've got nearly 5,000. He said, but only, he said, only 3,000 are active. And I went, what do you mean? And he goes, well, you've got to come in and you've got to cancel your membership. Mm. And most people just can't be bothered. Yeah. yeah. So there's people who knows Put that have maybe been hard, yeah. dead for twenty years, and <laughs> re- people are going, "Geez, I must be fit. That don't miss a day." <laughs> you know what I mean? There'd be people like just going around who mm. probably are dead that are still paying their gym fees. Yeah, mm. there would be. But it, it, it's interesting how that that human psyche um, works and and the addiction of social media. You mm. you can't stop scrolling. You, you just well, it's like the other going. night I went to a pub, you know, before the game. And had a mate there who was, I don't know, and it was like, I would like to say to him, no more. Or, mm-hmm. you know, me to go up and say, you know, not make the decision, go to the bar. But he just kept coming over and just giving it to me all the time. And I, I, I was too polite to say no more. Mm. Yeah. It happens to the best it of us. Yeah. 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 What am I doing waking up on the lounge? That's mm. right. I got home at 4.30. Yeah. I've only kind of done it again. <laughs> Aren't you too old for this, man? Oh. Kid? Yeah, sure. Oh, baby, you'll never get what. Well, guess what? I've been abducted by aliens for three days. But oh, I honestly, get... I, mm. I and they sprayed alcohol in my mouth. That's the reason, babe. I'm sorry, but this alien came. I was on my way home. I was just round the corner. Light came on. Up I went. Fucking, they held me captive. You, you're not going to believe me. You are not going to believe me. I tell but you it what, did happen, Jimmy. <laughs> this ha- this is so similar to a story when I was growing up. My dad. He coached an under-18 side, uh, I reckon it might have been 1979 or something like that because uh, I remember by that stage I was about I was only about eight or nine. You know, he was – he had – mum and dad had me they were about 18, so it wasn't a big difference. So even when I was sort of going out, the old man was still floating about a little bit, you know. Um, but so on this, this occasion, what had happened – was that he went and the side played their last game, the under-18 side at Cessnock, and we hadn't seen the old man for about three or four days. So the first couple of days, mum just said, ah, oh, he's out there having a good time. <laughs> and then by day three, she said, I might have to call the police. Anyway, she did a bit of searching around. No one could find him. It's starting to worry. Next minute, she gets a call. Hello. On the old landline, of course. Gail, it's Gary. Gary, where are you? The team abducted me. I'm up on the Gold Coast, right? <laughs> so what he'd been doing, Jimmy, right, for the month leading up to his abduction, every time they had a training session, he'd take one pair of jeans and a, sh- and a shirt and some shoes. And mum kept saying to him, 
Gary, that shirt I bought you you for Christmas. Gary, where are your clothes? Well, he was stockpiling Mm. at the football field, so... It's good thinking from the old man. <laughs> <laughs> the things we do. Another time he went, um, he went, I always used to go, what are these buck shows? he go, uh, oh, boys, I'm, oh, I got this on. I'm, we're going to, I'm going to the pub and this is the 70s. And I say, I'll come with you, Dad. No, 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 you can't. It's a buck show. And I go, what is this buck show? It sounds so exciting, which it is, Jimmy. <laughs> and um, again... Dad hadn't been seen for a couple of days. So mum starts ringing around. It turns out he's in in the hospital. Uh, When we got there, dad was face down and the nurse and the doctor were actually picking uh, asphalt and tar out out of his back and his ass. What he'd done, he was clowning around on a buck show. For whatever reason, he was in the back of a car naked. (laughs) Who knows, it might have been his shot. For whatever reason. <laughs> anyway, yeah. he fell out of the car and just went bouncing down the road. Ooh. And, uh, yeah, um, never really got up, uh, got to the bottom of what that was all about. Pardon the pun. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. nurses and the doctors did, <laughs> <Yeah>. though. <laughs> yeah. I'm here all week. <laughs> what is it with this room? It makes you just, it opens up. Now I know what Josh Mansour went through. <laughs> 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 oh dear! <laughs> Poor old source turned long. Ah, oh, we had a bit of chat about my career. Next minute, good timing for JD though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh dear! Man alive! Oh. Yeah, yeah. That is the secret of comedy. Yeah. Timing. Uh, yeah. Matt, you, your love of travel and your love of music as well. Um, Where's where's that born from? Because obviously a kid from Cessnock, I mean, yes. not going to uh, put you in a it, it box you in. But, yep, um, you know, not the the stereotypical traveller. No, no, no. You know what, Jimmy? I I think it was um, because I have no hobbies. Right, I have no hobbies outside of really drinking, socialising. All things social. That's my passion. I like people. Mm. Knocking around with people, Mm. uh, having a beer. So my wife, Trish, will say to me sometimes, I wish you would take up golf. I wish you'd, like, you know, Mm. talking about um, care for what you wish for. And I was like, I'm just not into it. You know, I might play bowls occasionally because you walk parallel to the clubhouse, but I just, Mm. I just, I'm not handy and I don't have a lot of, um, as a, a lot of pastimes at all. And so for me, it's music, it's reading, and it's travel. And I think I moved into that, Jimmy, because it for me, and it, it's not a conscious thing, but for me, in my mind, it balances things out because it's so easy, and I reckon it'd be the same for you, to just be eaten up by rugby league. You're driving, you're listening to a podcast on rugby league, mm. you're reading about rugby league, you're thinking about rugby league, you're making notes about rugby league, your work's rugby league. And so for me, that that provides me with the balance as opposed to me going surfing or playing golf or something. Mm. It, it is interesting the price you pay for having a, a singular focus. Mm. It's not something you necessarily... Um, would wish upon somebody. No, and that's and that's the reason why. I, like I support what Benji Marshall said about you know, I'm not going to be 24 seven coach, which I don't think anyone is really 24 seven. I mean, it's an exaggeration. Mm, he means yeah. basically I'm just obsessed and I'm moving. I've seen coaches destroy their own positions. I won't say their careers, but you know, mm. basically have have. Burned out a playing group so much it cut short their tenure at a club just by basically just what began that obsession and that being fastidious and worrying about this and doing that and watching where that come. Initially that brings a certain amount of success and accountability. Mm. Yep. After a certain period of time, as you know, Jimmy, it just burns the playing group completely out. And I, I'm always a real believer that players can and, and – and really and consciously will only take a certain amount of information in. So my, my thing about it is when I watched the West Tigers play last year and some of the stuff Benji was doing with Sheensy there and what he's, and little things he's done this year, I can see that the, the Tigers have a successful formula there that sits there. 
They play simple. They centralise everything. Most things stem off Appy Corsair, right? Up. Probably no reliance on Appy, and they just centralise. You know, they go. They don't move the ball sideways frivolously for any other reason. I like what Caesar's bring this year with the kicking. But my my point is, in my opinion, if I look at the West Tigers, there is a there is a formula that if they can play close to their best every week, it's going to be very very hard to beat. And I think they'll have quite a successful season. So if you've got the formula there and you settle on a formula, why would you drive – put it this way, I'll take another. If you've won eight in a row, Jimmy, the more you spend – the more time you spend in the office, if you've struck gold in the way you want to play, then I would say it's counteractive for you spending 16 hours a day worrying about the football because then you're probably starting to push – the side and your principles off course a little bit. I understand you've got to analyse the way different plays and nuances of how other teams are viewing you and you might need to adjust. But I just I, – I, I see benefits in what Benji had to say. Uh, I, I agree with you to an extent. Um, I think coaching uh, by its very nature has to be all in. Mm. And I think – the answer to the question of if we've won eight in a row and we've struck gold, why would we continue to work hard? Well, there's two points. No, we'll First, move we'll, away. More we'll move, move away. away. Yeah. Um, because you'd be fearful of the mindset of the players thinking that it's becoming easy, which mm. we know can happen. And also, I think uh, we strive for perfection. Yeah, or sure. coaches would strive for perfection. Yeah. So you may think we've struck gold, but you know you're yeah, chasing the impossible, the impossible yep. dream of 100% completion. Yep. No missed tackles. Yep. No tries conceded. No penalties conceded. No six again. We win every rook in both defense and attack. I think there's this striving for perfection mm. and always wanting to be better. Wayne Bennett used to say, yeah. he'd give his ratings out of 10. He's never given a 10. Mm. Yeah, so I think that I think that's what it is. I've thought about this because mm. I, the, the research out there suggests that um, any individual can't concentrate for something like more than like fifteen minutes on mm. a particular topic. So yep. if you give a lecture, if you go over fifteen minutes, you're screwed and you should break it up. Mm. Um, also, with the messages to the co from the coaching staff to the player around two or three yep. key messages, yep. not information overload. But we know that coaches live in fear of, I know something or I've seen something, I've got to tell them. Of course. And, or if I'm not watching every single game from every different angle that's available, if I'm not watching training, I might miss something. And that might bite me in the arse And the crucial moment. And mm. we know that grand finals, semifinals, state of origins, test matches can come down to one moment. Mm. And not a, f f that requires yep. millimetre precision. Yep. A couple of things, Jimmy. I think you you need to really – you've got to have trust in your players, um, firstly. And I think, like, you've got to have trust in your players sometimes. Like, if I was coaching now, Jimmy, I'd say, right, uh, what we're going to do, we're going to meet – this is when we're meeting in the morning. We're going to do a few hours hard work here. We'll do a little bit of video after you. I want you to go away. I want you to go away. I want you to find that balance in your life, spend time, whether it be your, your wife and your kids and whatnot, and I'm going to get you back here at 4 o'clock in the afternoon we're going to put another couple of hard hours work. Now, people will say, well, maybe there could be some drama there because, you know, can you trust the players? Well, if you can't trust the players in that position, you haven't got the right players. Mm -hmm. right the, the sweet spot for me, Jimmy, is that I think the last thing you want to be is a coach, and you just said something there, where you go, I've got to tell this person, I've just, it's here, and I've got to go and tell him. How many times you've been in the dressing room, and mentally you're ready to go, and you go, oh, he's fucking coming up again here, fucking hell. Mm. Jimmy, one more thing, you know the one more thing, yeah, and one more thing, and you're going, he's killing me. Yes, yes, he's not trusting me. Um, I think, I think the sweet spot from from my experience playing Jimmy, the sweet spot for me was we trained really hard. Mm. Number two, we really understood how we we're going to play. We understood the principles, how we we're going to play. 
Um, and then, then number three, the coach undercoached us to an extent, right? To a, granted, we had an experienced football side. We had myself and Andrew, we had Paul Harrigan and different got Tony Butterfield. We had an experienced side to come through simul simultaneously. And that allowed a guy like Malcolm Reilly, who was far and away the best coach I ever had, taught us, went from being boys, taught us to be men, handle pressure. He would, Malcolm would undercoach us. Right? Once he put in place the things that worked for us, although we trained hard, mentally he... He undercoached us. He didn't overcoach us in videos. If someone, Jimmy, if you knocked a ball on, let's say you're taking the ball up and you fumbled, he'd at least know to go, Jimmy knows. He knows that. It's an error. I'm not going to show that embarrassing, all those mm. things. That style of coaching for me, Jimmy, was the sweet spot. E even to the point, Jimmy, is that if a coach if a coach steps away, Jimmy, right, we're being coached by, by a guy and all of a sudden – he just steps away a little bit, consciously steps away, then guess what? I can guarantee that you and I and the other leaders will fill that mm. space Yeah, and inspire the other guys. With the Malcolm Reilly story, the best example I got with Malcolm is Malcolm, he had us for a couple of years, 95, 96, and he'd put in place how he wanted us to play. Exactly. 96 wasn't such a good year, but we learned a lot from our father years uh, and – so we started the 97 season training well and then Malcolm, if I remember correctly, I think his dad was sick. So he had to go back to England. Went back to England uh, for a few weeks. As he left, our reserve grade coach uh, was poached and one of our other coaches was poached. So effectively we in, in the whole club, at one point it was like we had one coach. We had a skills guy and we had fitness guys. Mm. I don't know. And then Malcolm came back and then something else happened. I might have, might have been with his mum. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, Jim. But basically Malcolm was nearly missing that whole pre-season. So to an extent, not, not fully, we were still getting trained and he would liaise with us from a distance. But we had to look after ourselves and then have a look at ourselves and go, how are we playing? Why, what worked in 95? What do we move away from? Where do we need to go? How is the game changing? Fair play to Malcolm. Very 0.1% of coaches would be willing to do this. Basically, swallow the re he came back, right? Played a, uh, a trial game against the Tigers. He didn't think we're that good. And I, he went for a walk with me and said, What have you fucking been doing while I've been away? And I said, No, we're training. We're trained we're trained really hard, Malcolm. But these are the things we're looking to do. We're a little bit scratchy first up. No problem. And he played Manly in the second trial and we beat Manly. He went away and said, yeah, we're on the right track. No problem. Now that year we went on to win the competition. Mm -hmm. And two things there is Malcolm, through necessity, had to step out of the space and we had to go and fill it. And we had to work out in the playing group, right, uh, how we're going to play. So when you work out yourself, you absolutely believe in it. Mm. Right, uh, and even when Malcolm come back, we do, we'd be doing a video, we're going to a big game, and he'd say, right, uh, we're playing the Roosters here. Rather than he dictate to us, say, right, they've uh, got to play this way, he'd go, they've got this guy, uh, they've got this guy, they've got Fittler. You guys tell me. How do, where are they vulnerable and how are we going to beat them? So we'd all sit there as a group, nat around, and he'd have his say, and what about that? I'm not sure about that. But then we'd settle on a game plan and you go out and you beat them. So this is, there was a sense of ownership. Oh, yes, it was. So do you know, J Jimmy, he was a tough taskmaster. Uh, tough taskmaster. He had principles how he wanted you, where, where you had to get to as far as your performance and more to the point, your effort, your level of fitness and commitment. But mentally, it was the easiest experience I've ever had in football. For me, there was no anxiety. There was no, oh, what, where, what's the coach thinking? He'd just come up and tell you. Mm -hmm. You were never in, you were never uncertain. It was, a, it was a fantastic environment because we had young guys like Owen Craigie and young guys like Troy Fletcher coming through and lots of young fellas. Well, they had as much say as we did because we enabled that and Malcolm enabled that it was just and, and it wasn't probably till later on that I realized to go like that was professional sport 
in name, but it didn't feel like it. It actually felt like when you're a kid and you're playing a game. Now, to, for us to get to that point, we had to go through a lot of stuff. But I suppose my original point is, is that when the formula's right, I think a 24-7 coach can drive you mad. And, and like, you know, players tell me about Wayne, you know, Wayne walking in. Now, when Wayne, I've heard this off numerous players and he's done it numerous times. The side has played really poorly. You know, and he's walked in on the Monday and the players, he said nothing after the game. He just sits there, the players go, jeez. And I reckon when he says nothing, you go away, it's even worse. And you're thinking to yourself, what's he thinking? You know, in a lot of ways, you've corrected, you've already in your own mind corrected your complacency or whatever. And then Wayne will walk in on a Monday, sometimes walking in and dancing, go to put the video on and go, ah, oh, fucking don't worry, let's get out in the field and work. Mm. You know, I, I, that, that for me is him trusting his players and probably knowing they've corrected his mind, but also him going, he did that wrong, he did that wrong, he did that but I'm going to back him to get it right. I'm not going to overimpose myself on him. It takes a certain type of character to mm. be that way with a certain level of experience. And uh, it's almost not even coaching, it's psychology. Yeah. Well, I, well Wayne is a master, isn't it? Mm. Mm. I just... Can one approach be applied to every group? Because oh, no. there are some teams that I feel they maybe need that yes. uh, yeah. ultimate dictatorship direction. And, you know, you said that Malcolm really, he worked you hard. Yes. Now, everybody that plays at all 17 teams currently, yeah, we train hard. Mm. Now, there's training hard. And there's... And there's, I'm looking to tap. And yeah. I'm, I'm running back to... I'm running on Belmore Oval mm -hmm. and I go back towards the train line and I see a train go past and it's like, I think I'm still alive because yeah. I've seen the train go past mm -hmm. versus some other places where it's like, oh, yeah, we train hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Malcolm, Malcolm, when he first came to Newcastle, the first drill he implemented as far as our fitness concerned has become probably one of the most notorious drills in the NRL, the Malcolm. The Malcolm. And that was off Malcolm really. You know, letting is people that, 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 that's that? Malcolm, yes. That was his drill. Getting up, getting back. In. And I remember the first what time a, we did a it. Fucking legacy to leave. Yeah, to <laughs> the, the, the mouth. Yeah. yeah. The the exercise that surpassed the burpee yeah. has been yeah. the toughest. And yeah, you know, to let people know, to do a set of six on, on a Malcolm might take you. How long would it take you, Jimmy? Yeah, 60 seconds. Like, oh, if you're down on every Yeah, probably a, so, a minute, maybe yeah, a minute. Yeah, but for, your for legs time. are yeah. absolutely you burn. So when Malcolm first came to Newcastle, he said, "Right, we're going to do Malcolm's. We're going to go six, five, four, three, two, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, mm. six, four, five. I just kept going, and it was it was just it was a nightmare. And then the next day, he said, "Right, we're going to go to uh, Broadmeadow Racecourse, Newcastle, and he'd start us all at twelve hundred meters, and he would stand at the finishing line with his cool hand Luke, Luke sunglasses <laughs> and just sit there saying nothing." And just watch us, you know, you know, taking tabs on, right, uh, of all the halfbacks. Where did Andrew finish? Where did he finish? And it was like never trained so hard in our lives. Mm. But then um, he married that with not playing mind games. Yeah. The fitness, the fitness gave you, the fitness was the mind games. You know, getting yourself right, getting yourself up. I'm feeling a little bit tired today. I'm able to do this. You know, I, I'll come on two more efforts to go. Encourage others when you're feeling tired. He let the foot, fitness play the mind games for us. He was just a coach, someone to bounce off. Strong disciplinarian, but just as I said, you know, you know, you've had coaches mm. that play mind games. You know, <laughs> bullshit like, mm. "How you going, Jimmy? I tell you what, the the kid over there is, in, who could easily fill your jersey." And you're going, is he having a fucking go at me? You know, I don't need that bullshit. Mm. Yeah, there was none of that. Uh, it's funny. The the ingredients that's required to be a successful coach in an organisation, there's, there's some, I think, nailed on principles that are non-negotiables, mm. but there's some where you've got to adapt to the group. Just mm. on that, mm. um, you speak a lot about coaching. And I was going to say this question for the end, but I'm going to ask you mm. now. What would it take for Matthew Johns to do a Gary Neville or a Benji Marshall? Has Gary Neville gone into coach? He did. 
Did he? How'd he go? Not well. There you go. <laughs> I think, where did he? I think he went somewhere in Sp maybe Seville. Oh, did he? Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Okay. Where he went, he's bro went. His brother's over there. F Phil coaches the, I think he was coaching the English women's national team. Not anymore. Not the Lionesses anymore. But he, yeah. he is involved in coaching. He was, I thought he was a Real Sociedad or one of those clubs. I'm, oh, I'm not sure. sure where he's at now. But yeah, Gary Neville left Monday Night Football to go and coach in Spain. Much to the amusement of Jamie Carragher, uh, it went pear-shaped. Yeah. And obviously Benji Marshall was heavily involved in the yeah. media. He left. What, what would it take for for I, you to do that? I think to be completely down on my luck. <laughs> we don't, no, <laughs> it, I, it would actually, <laughs> no, it would be to the point, it would be for for whatever circumstances is that the, what I'm doing now is no longer there and then going, right, oh, this is, I'm going to back myself here. I can do this and have a crack. Jimmy, however, at this point or where I'm at, probably my next role that I would do in coaching because I've done miles of one-on-one -on -one stuff and a little specialty stuff with, you know, with, with teams that'll come in and do a bit of stuff and for a year or two and then go, is I think now the greatest kick that I would get in if I was going to coaching would be that more experienced bloke who would act like a bit of cartilage between the team and the head coach, if that makes sense. You know that bloke yeah. who sort of gets around, mm. he understands the players you can give the coach a little bit of stu stuff, but just helping the young guys through, being there every single day and understand the pressures that they're under and how to alleviate that. I think for me, rather than the tactical side, I think the relationship side mm. is probably the thing that appeals to me. So well, for me to be a head coach... A change in segment? What? Why? Why? Why would I do no, it? Why would you not? Um, why would you not? Um, I tell you, Jimmy. Uh, w w why is there a lack of ambition to um, to go down that it's road? It's not lack of ambition, oh, Jimmy. I know I know myself too well, though. So the other day, I've had. So there is ambition there. Sorry. No longer. Well, put it this way, Jimmy. I'd never say no, but I think. Uh, but I think where I'm at at the moment, it's a long, long shot. If I was to go back into coaching, I think now it would be yeah, that, the per that, that role I was talking about. For good, okay, so why? What, sorry, go on. Yeah. So the reason is, Jimmy, like I've said recently to people uh, on the record, I said I used to have these exercise books that I used to have exercise book next to me when I was asleep and I'd wake up in the middle of the night, think of a sequence or a shape and just sit mm. and write them down. Next to me I'm up for an hour and I'm writing it and writing and writing. Now, these exercise books, I know Trish went, I don't know how many I had, probably 20 or 30. I'm going to throw them out. And we just carted them from house to house every time we moved until finally I think I thought, I thought that she'd thrown them out and good riddance. Anyway, my oldest son, Jack, came and said, have a look what I found. And he found all these exercise books. Uh, books. So we're sort of filtering through them going, Oh, yeah, and I see. What was I thinking there? Oh, that's right. You know, this this shape, super BK, how does that work? Do we need there? Oh, yeah, that does still work. What about this? Mm, not so much. So we're just going through it, you know, sort of book at a time. And I'm thinking to myself, fuck me, dead. How much time have I wasted throughout my life? That makes sense. So for me, when I retired, Jimmy, right, I was so ready to retire mentally because – it wasn't like I could just go out there and play on a Sunday, Jimmy. I wasn't Joey. I'm completely – we're completely different people and, yeah, hello, Scoop, we're completely different footballers. But for me to be – to me to, to play a game that was seven and a half, eight out of ten, I had to put myself through the ringer, like mentally, you know, th uh, th overthinking, all that stuff. Andrew could just go out, go out and do it because right, it's a natural. Now, Jimmy, if I put myself – and a lot of those times I, I – I wasn't there for my wife. I'm not there for my friends because you're talking to me, Jimmy, when I'm that person, that player, and I'm going, yeah, yeah. And all I'm thinking about is, oh, I've got to make sure I've got to write that down. Something's come to me. I was absent completely. Yeah. And I don't want to be that person again. But then you could do the Benji Marshall role. Yeah. Not the 20, Benji Marshall Not 24-7. For me. I'm so a, you would naturally fall into that? I would naturally fall into that bloke who basically would – go to sleep every night with a you know 20 blank pages next to me and wake up with just and fill them and i i i enjoy my life too much now jimmy
to actually go back into that. My life, I look, I, um, I'm basically I'm at a stage of my life that I have I have no desire to go into something just to basically, you know, prove something to my own ego. I'm 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 past that. You know, that it's very easy to go, you know, I could do that. You know what? You know, I think I could. Theoretically, I think I could. You know, I can manage people pretty good. Maybe I could, but there's no guarantees. You know, you might be, look like the ideal bloke for the job and you go in there during the circumstances and it, it just doesn't work out. It's, it's the way it is. Does that not excite you? The I, do, I, would lo- I, I, I would really enjoy the challenge, Jimmy. I would, I would really enjoy it, but I know how it would manifest with me it would get to the point that i would drive myself insane and i it's very hard to hide that from the players because mate you've had you've been coached by blokes who are obsessive and like that and you actually you start to go fucking hell like but also you know it 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 certainly affect my wife's life Mm -hmm. because i i'd I'd just i'd never be i'd never be there i'd be there physically but i wouldn't be there emotionally or yeah, spiritually, I just I just wouldn't be there. Yeah, mm. it, it's true what you say about head coaches' um, lack of presence. Oh when yeah, you speak to them because uh, in yeah. in social settings, yeah, they're just n- n- not there. It's and a, and yeah. with Benji, you just wonder if he's going to be able to afford himself that luxury of now I've got this three hour allocation of time with my family because. Player injuries, they're going for a scan. <gasps> What's the scan result? Yes, uh, of course. To just, just, just call me and, yeah. Doc, I just need yeah. to know, is this player yeah. torn his hamstring or not? I, I just want to know. Well, I, 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 uh, is the contract signed? Is he re-signed or not? What's he doing? Is his manager yeah. called? What's his manager saying? Is there another offer? Like, yep. just... It was insane. You're right with Benji. What a discipline that's going to be. It is going to require a me- tremendous amount. And uh, I hope it's not the case because I'm a real soft spot for the Tigers, but you might get to a case through the year. Jesus, we're facing five or six losses mm. on the row. There's pressure starting, you know. Oh, well, come on, let's, you know, anyway, it's it's time for, you know, we're going to go to little Johnny's party. Here we go. I don't know if I can go there. I've got too many things to worry about. That just... I can imagine that that'll be a very difficult discipline. Yeah. Um, just on the, the coaching thing, it's no coincidence it's that type of player that you were that tends to lead to uh, better coaches, so those that need to be consumed by the game rather than just brilliant because, mm. you know, your brother could just say, well, Don't just do, do that. Just, just do it. Just, well, mm. what do you mean you can't throw a yeah. 20? Yeah. What, or why? Why yes. can't you see that the wing is up and yeah. you need to put the kick in? Like, what, yeah. what do you mean? Well, well no, you yeah. need to teach me how to do it. But, you know, with that all that, that, that coaching style where you're writing, do you ever fall into that trap even though you're not a coach? And you're like, oh, I saw something there. Yeah, I, yeah, I do. Oh, I, yeah. There's an opportunity. If they go mm. out from dummy half, back to the guy playing the ball, that there's a three on two that I they're it, missing. Every, any person who's played... I think there's always that that there. It always sits inside mm. you. Well, if I sit, I'll sit in the lounge uh, with a beer and another beer and a few beers. I sit there and I've always got the blank piece of paper in front of me and I'm writing. The only difference is when I get in the morning, I can't understand what I've written about. <laughs> I think we've all had that mm. quite a bit. But, yeah, it, I always just sort of make a, little notes and points like that. But, yeah, that's and that's, that's one of the things like I really – I actually think too, Jimmy, is that – the type of coaching that I do only very occasional now but have done since I retired might be more pure coaching than what the head coaches have to endure because, mate, they're worrying about everything. I'm lucky. They say, can you come and just do a bit of coaching with the halves? And we're sitting there and we're working on specific coach, coaching. We know this, that and the other, the little nuances of ball playing and the art of ball playing. We're doing this. We're wondering about shapes. It's pure coaching. Talking to like Craig Bellamy once, a, a club uh, 12, 13 years ago it might have been, reached out to me 
and said, we'd like you to apply for the job. And I'm like, hmm, okay. Sort of pricked the ego a little bit and thought, yeah. So I rang Craig Bellamy up and I said, because I'd work, I'd been working with Melbourne before. So Let me guess, you said, I didn't realise you were losing your job. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, I've got some news for you. <laughs> You're out. Got bad news. <laughs> Sorry. Continue. So I rang him and I said, uh, <laughs> I said to him, um, mate, listen, this is what's going on. He said, mate, he said, you're kidding. He said, you would hate it. And I went, well, what do you mean? And he goes, mate, that's stuff you come down and do. He said, that's coaching. He said, most of the stuff with coaching isn't coaching. It's you're doing you're doing your bit of coaching with the thing, but you're doing you're doing video, you're doing edit. You guys in your man managing guys, you're coming, you're worrying about this, you're worrying about that, you're doing sponsors. He said there is that much. He said there's that much of it. He said the the coaching element is getting smaller and smaller. And he said, I just know your personality. He said after two weeks you'd be bored. And I said, He's probably right. I reckon he's doing you there. Yeah, he's done you. Yeah, he's, he's saw, shitting himself right. about yeah. you coming in he, he, and he taking heard, it. Like, he heard the he footsteps just, he's coming just behind him. Yeah, what? Yeah. The, to be honest, the, Jimmy, what happened? I tried to white him, but they wouldn't yeah. sack him. <laughs> <laughs> no, I reckon he's gone. Yeah. I don't want this person coaching against me. He's, I'll, he, I'll, I'll tell him how horrible it is. Yeah. Well, you should have said, "Well, what are you doing it for yeah. then?" Yeah, that's like, right. Yeah. Hey, tell you what. You know, I think you're hey, on the this, this heroin this is no good for <laughs> you. Know. Oh, mate, <laughs> Josh means to. <laughs> <laughs> mate, I reckon he's done you. Yeah. Yeah, you might be onto something. I'll give the prick a call when I get off here. <laughs> I'll say, listen, I am the man. Take over you, not <laughs> Rosie. Yeah. Hey, um, you speak about um, growing, growing up in, in Cessnock um, and learning the, the game. Uh, just... How did that manifest? Because you know, th I've thought about this a lot about children's sport today and mm. the Oz tag, the tag, the smaller side of games. I'd be right in thinking you were just launched into 13 a side on a full field, right? At the age of about what, six, seven? Five. Five? Yeah, full yeah. fit, full yeah, it was professional so side, professional, like 100 meters by 50, whatever it was. Yeah, back in those yeah. days, Jimmy, there was, uh, there was no mini mod football. No. I'd gone through it was literally. Um, basically, yeah, and it was dad. There was no in Cessnock, so I had. It was like it was similar to my school days. Uh, I had five years in, under nines, so I started when I was five, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So how so did I, you, how did you, how did you figure the game out? Back then, I don't know. I can't remember, but um, figuring the game, Jimmy, it's just we'd play. And, you know, right up until, you know, with teenagers, you, mate, you go, right, we're going to play touch. Or when you're younger, you go and play tackle. You you know, you finish playing with the, your side, St. Patrick, St. Patrick Cessnock. And then you go behind the town hall, the patch of grass there, and you go and play all night there. So you develop the natural instincts and you develop the natural vocabulary because, again, my dad coached for years and years when he did his knee. So you understand to go, all right, I'm outside. Come on, turn a guy under, all that sort of stuff. But all the stuff that – all that was just instinctive, Jimmy. It wasn't until I went to the Newcastle Knights at incredibly luck, lucky time where there was all these great coaches there. They were, they were basically going through a, a period where they made a decision because they didn't have the money to go and buy players – educate all our younger players to the basically to an inch of their life and then the best ones will come through and so when we first got to the knights there was no there was a guy there who i've spoken many times before alan bell who was an old goat farmer but he'd been here there and everywhere as assistant coach he was at newcastle and he was like talking to john lennon about music you've been a scouser and it was like he'd just sit and grab myself and andrew sometimes for hours just with video going, stop. I'll show you why Kevy Wallace is a good ball player. Stop. Alton Langer plays this way. Stop, right? -er. Do 20 minutes on Alfie, right? -er. Let's go now to like Paul Langmack, the way he used to play short sides. Stop, right? -er. Now let's go to this bloke. Let's go to this bloke. You see a tear live with the football. And so you're watching and you're getting saturated with this information. But also you've got other stuff, Jimmy, to go saying things like, right, -er, this is what you do, boys. The field is like a mathematical equation. 
You've got length of the field, but you've got 10%, 20%, 30%, 40% for you. And you teach the vocabulary. So, Matty, if you want to send, if you want to put an attacking sequence that starts at the far post, right, uh, let's go, whether it be two or three, let's go to the 60, you know. And then on the way there, if you're thinking the hit back and you can sense there's numbers, always say, think and les, think and les, let, let them tip off and form. Or think and ron, which means you're going to go the same way. So it was all this stuff teaching us attacking patterns, teaching us like stuff about coming out of trouble, the golden rules of defence, things you don't do, things you do. So all this was just thrown into us to the point that you actually go, am I going insane here? But then all of a sudden, Jimmy, the day hits, boom, and everything starts to click. And for, of course, like we never had at Newcastle the success that Penrith are having, you know, it goes without saying. They're an incredible group. But all those blakes were educated simultaneously that have come through. Hence the reason when you're playing and they get going, they're attacking, you go, there's no fucking setups. Like they just instinctively know how the pieces of the jigsaw just fall into place and where Nathan's going to do it, stuff like that. And that's how it was with us, with that Newcastle side, is that the core of that football side, probably seven or eight of us, were educated simultaneously. Uh, form, we'd formed combinations. We understood how each of us played to the point that even on the field sometimes you didn't have to communicate that much. Each player knew what we're all trying to do, particularly when like you'd set up the start of an attacking sequence, say, Jimmy, and you go like I was just saying there, like right, I'd say right, let's, yeah, let's say for instance, let's go to the 50 to the middle. Me and Andrew would split and you'd say, right, what size looks vulnerable, a little short, and you go bang and the, the person who suspected it or had the best opportunity would take it down that side. Right, a, a, a really flat, fast play, there were, you know, plenty of bodies in motion and the goal was not so much to make a break and score, that's a bonus, but the number was to attract defenders over to that threat, to gather numbers over towards that scrum line and then once he did that, we didn't even think, we didn't even talk. Everyone knew that the ball was going to go to the other side of the field as quick as we could. Like a false flag. That's it. That's it. So it, that was, uh, Jimmy, that was regardless of who came in as coach I don't know, and they would have their own ideas and principles, that principle that we were taught when we first walked into the Newcastle Knights never left us. Yep. It's, it's almost like a, a finely tuned algorithm. Mm. So if we go two to the 50, in all likelihood, it, this will happen. Mm. and there will be an opportunity presented over on this side of the field. Yep. But if it doesn't, because if we predict, if they predict what we are going to set up, then yeah. the opportunity will be need to be taken later on. So if they do yeah. X, here's the, here's the, here's yeah. the, the, you know, every action has a reaction. Yep. You already knew the reaction to their action. And, and, you then the react, and it's yeah. just no matter what, That's here's, right. you, you you can you can't be perfect because we've got enough things to do mm. and when you think this play is coming we'll have a variation yeah. on it and we'll be prepared for that yeah. variation because the, our mm. algorithm is going to see you and we're yeah. going to react we're going to be so finely tuned mm. that we're going to be able to react to your action in defense which is going to create an opportunity yeah. for us based off the yeah. repetition and the knowledge that we well, have. even even sometimes Jimmy you'd actually, on first receiver, you would take the ball to where the more numbers were. And you go, well, why would you do that? Well, it's the easy way to gather more numbers. You know what I mean? So all of a Suck sudden, them in. pull them in. And mm. you might pull another one that way. And all of a sudden, the, the side that looked vulnerable from a half field then, mate, looks really vulnerable at a long field when you've gathered so many so many players across. And the other said you said about an algorithm is that the reason why back in the day moving to the middle of the field worked so good is you could preempt it's going to be a 5-5 five, five split. Mm. You know, 5-5, five, five, two markers, one at the back. And the guys dribbling back, you know, sort of dribbling their way back, but it gave you a really easy read of where to go and it really exposed those middles, okay, who's looking tired. But now these days the 5-5 five, five split sort of become – you know, going moving the ball to the middle these days is almost like resetting the the defence. It's a bit like when you, you know, um, so they they go like 
past the far post to make it more of a 3-7 or a 4-6. But it's like me saying to you, Jimmy, like um, um, it's like, you know, let's say, for instance, we did that, right, when we're playing, we're playing together and I go, right, let's go to the middle and we're just going to do our little setup play for use of a better term. Right, uh, me and Andrew are split and I go, right, I'm going to take the ball here. Well, I go to the left. Now, your natural thing to be a forward is, okay, right, uh, give me the ball, I'm going to settle it back in. But the reason you – the moment you do that, Jimmy, is that all you've done is reset the defence. That makes sense. Mm. You know what I mean? So you're putting yourself – that's one of the things I get guilty of with sides is they're always resetting. In my opinion, unless it's a hell of a defensive play or a great tackle that drives you backwards, once the kettle's boiling, once you've gone, we're going to go two here or we're going to take one here and you start to play, don't stop. Just keep playing. Don't stop. Don't playing. stop. Keep playing, even to the point, and I say to young halves, even to the point, don't worry about shapes. Don't, sometimes if they're looking vulnerable, the last thing they want the ball player to do is to take the ball and go at them again. And even if you're not sure what you're going to do, just challenge them. What they want is for me to say to one of the middles, take us forward. <sighs> make the defender, Get make you, a decision. Hold you, wrestle you, put you on the ground. 5-5 five, five split again. Mm. So we're back to the start. And if you watch Penrith play now, well, I love watching Penrith play. It's because originally, as I said, they've been educated simultaneously. The combinations have been forged over years. They don't – once they – when they really get humming and playing good, there's no setups. It's hit. Shapes fall into shapes. So you might have a block formation. If Nathan hits short, he'll rip around the same way with, the, with an identical formation. And even to the point, Jimmy, sometimes you're saying about how we're, we're going to act, we're going to do something here which you're going to say, yeah, we can handle this. You know, we, we, we know what you're doing here. We're going to handle that. No problem. But they're setting you up for something else. It's like the night when they played, I think it was Parramatta. Quite, not quite like Penrith. They, were, they went sideline to sideline a little bit. And you're going, okay, this is interesting. But what happens is when it hit one sideline after about the second or third shift, they offload out the back and Moses Leota went tip, tap, toe and just went straight through and scored under the post. And, you know, and for me that was them playing sideline to sideline, upsetting, disrupting the Parramatta defensive line back on the inside, which let them play through. So for Penrith, a, such a deliberate side, you know, I'm stating the obvious here, you know, they've won three, they're on their way to – trying to win four comps in a row, but they, they everything they do is so decisive um, and nothing is done without a reason. Why Why do you think um, a lot of halves don't play that way? I think because what happened is, Jimmy, is that I, don't, I think they came through a system in, ju in juniors that – they weren't as fortunate as guys like myself and Andrew and the guys at Newcastle and some of the guys like Nathan who have come through is that I think at times in junior football, they're – I was going to say they're being coached by people who don't really know. I'm being, that's me being kind. And what it is a lot of times is they – some coaches, it's a safety first approach. Yeah. No, you know what I reckon it is, Jim? They're too structured. I think a lot of the junior coaching is way too structured. But on, on top of that, I think in the juniors sometimes you can – it's a it's a worry um, or it's sort of counteractive sometimes to have a really ambitious young coach coaching your juniors. Because if, if, if you give me a junior side, Jimmy, I look at them and I go, right, uh, Okay, what are, and I'm an ambitious coach. What am I going to do? You know, I'm working on the tools through the day, but I really want to be a first grade coach. How do I get this side to win? Number one, completions. Number two, let's you know, don't do any of this stuff. Uh, dummy half run, kick long, just get in with pressure. Now that's that's great to win a game, Jimmy. Right? Uh, but how many top line, like halves, does that produce? Well, I was going to say, is the goal itself not the correct one? To win games because as a junior coach, are you there to win games? No, and not if I was the head coach for thing. His no, job yeah. would so he'd if be you're the head coach completely. Not, yeah, are producing players. Yeah. For me. I, I don't. I don't mm. care. You win loss record. But if you're yeah. that junior coach, you think 
I need to show I can win. Yes. And I say to him, no, you, you need to show me you can produce players. Yeah. So it's a big difference. A big difference because, Jimmy, if you can produce players, you can coach. Right? Uh, just because you win games at junior level doesn't mean you can coach because you go and you watch him and you say they're not moving the ball at all. They're just kids picking the ball up and running for a dummy half. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. You can win junior football games with the biggest kid by, on the field. Well, biggest, biggest kid in the field. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, just with the way halves are moving now as well, do you think – how have you seen the role of, of 13? So I, yeah. I watch Isaiah Yo, and I mean this sincerely. I, if I was building a team mm. and I had the choice between Isaiah Yo and Nathan Cleary, mm. or if I was beginning a team, I'd take Isaiah Yo. If I was going to win a premiership, mm. I'd get Cleary. Mm. Because I think that role of the 13 now gives the half – so much more space. It does. Well, yeah. how, how have you found, in your observations, mm. the impact of that ball playing lock? Uh, I think that uh, up until uh, a couple of years ago, I think Isaiah was the most important player on the side. I think Nathan, obviously, is now as, as Nathan has matured and gone to that next level and next level again, and is that he has, of course, become the most important player. But yeah, it, it's very interesting with the thirteen, Jimmy. The thirteen, the thirteen is probably. Um, gone through so many changes and there's so different many ways how to play a 13. Like originally my dad was the 13 was coming through and he used to, he said, I said, how did you used to play dad? Like, what was your thing? And he said, my job was to play the short sides. You know, back in the day when the centres would swing, yeah, you know, yeah. and the halves Inside would outside, swing. Yeah. yeah, and you go that side and the half, the 5-8 would come around outside the half and they'd all link together. And Dad said, what I would do, he said, my job was to gravitate to the short side and look after the blind side. Yeah, that's, they used to go the blind side, side yeah. up the blind side, short side playing. And 13s were very good, traditionally good at that because they were robust guys who could run, use their hips, they were tough guys and they were really good short ball players, which is essential to play up a short side. Um, so that was the thing. You had guys like Ray Price who were cle you know, clever with the hands, Rod Reddy who was incredibly clever with the hands. Then all of a sudden there was a change in the game. Um, Bradley Clyde come along. Bradley Clyde was, you know, side knocks the ball downfield, Clyde gets back and takes play two. So it became the age of 13. And there were still some guys around, like Jason Smith and Jimmy Dimmick, the drill bit. But straight away, what teams started to look for was the big, strong 13. And, of course, as years, as the decades went on, then you started to have Talmalolo and so on and so forth. Suddenly someone made, I don't know which player exactly it was, but then all of a sudden you had um, a guy who could get in the middle and help the halves out and look, do a little bit of ball playing. Even to the, you know, to the point, Jimmy, if I'm playing 13, I'm not necessarily trying to put you through a gap, but I'll say to you, Jimmy, yeah, I'll tip it on to you. I'll take two steps, tip it on to you, get a one, get a one-on-one -on -one mm. tackle. So there was the real benefit having a, another, uh, another set of eyes there and another thinking player in the middle of the field so that the halves could stand back and go, let them go. Let them go forward. We're just going to watch and react. And and that's the beauty with Nathan is you watch Nathan sometimes, particularly you know, a couple of years ago, he's sort of been more fourth right now. But you can see he's saying to Isaiah, right, let's work to there. And Isaiah says, sweet, I'll do that. And he takes them there all the time. So it's not just working to a point on the field. When you've got a, got a, uh, got a clever 13, Jimmy, he can play football there. So although you're doing hit-ups, we're effectively just working to a point on the field. You know, that clever 13 still throwing questions to you, getting them one-on-one -on -one tackles. He's dropping players off. Dropping players off. Like, play, yeah, imagine that, like seeing the 13 go across the field and Drop. turn his middle forward underneath and, to get to a point. And, Jimmy, for us, if we're defending the middle, that's tiring. Yeah. Because what think, we have to think. We're going here, we're thinking. I'm saying, Jimmy, you got him, who you got? We're non-stop, we're talking. All of a sudden, they turn the ball over, kick it downfield. We go... Fuck me. Mm. Then we're going to get back and work. Mm. Mm. And it'll catch up with me later on. Well, yes. Because I'll, I'll need to make a decision or I'll need to tie in and I'll miss my assignment because I'm, I've oh, I've been mentally taxed as well as physically. Well, that, And you watch Penrith, right? So Penrith, a couple of times this year, but in the, in the grand final, it's the most obvious example that comes to mind, is that Penrith, when they're really attacking... Jimmy, they're throwing so much at you all the time. 
is that unless you've got a lion's share of possession, they're going to burn you out of gas. Yeah. So even to the point that, mate, the, they dominated the possession in the first half and probably had most possession even when the Broncos are winning 24-8. But the Panthers just throw so much at you is that, that if you don't, at the back end of the game, if you don't dominate possession, uh, possession you'll at least get 55%, mate, you, your, your fuel tank is just about been exhausted. We saw it in the Penrith game in round two. Uh, sorry, Penrith Parramatta is that they started uh, Penrith a million miles an hour and somehow, somehow Parramatta absorbed so much pressure and led 18-16. Yeah. But then they came out second half, didn't, fought, didn't, didn't score a point from memory. It's because Penrith, no, they, they, just, they just burn you up. They mm. do. Um, it is actually incredible to watch that process mm. unfold to the naked eye, you're like, oh shit, this is happening. Um, you speak of combinations and, and the one with your brother. Mm. How fortunate were you to to grow up with the genius? Well, mate, the, th- the thing about it was I, I was lucky at, uh, on two levels because of the fact that, uh, you know, and I'm the older brother, I'd like to think it was the other way as well around, is that whenever spare time, we're in the backyard playing football yeah. all the time. So from that angle, yes. Uh, the other angle was the fact that to be alongside someone who, not just your brother, but you're being, edu- like I said before, educated simultaneously, football-wise, was an enormous benefit. And probably what helped me a little bit on top of that was the fact that uh, he's considered m- possibly, arguably, the greatest player of all time. That sort of helped me a little bit as well, <laughs> along as well, Jimmy. But it was, yeah, it, 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 was, it, was, it was pretty uh, amazing sometimes some of the things he did and to see how, you know, he evolved. Um, because he went from being sort of when I played alongside Andrew, it wasn't until the last couple of years that I used to see him actually completely dominate and take control of a set. Joey was more like, just go forward for me. Uh-huh. You know, like I remember here, like you were saying before about me overthinking all the time. Remember once we were playing the Dragons, it was a hell of a game. Uh, 96, not long to go, they're beating us and Joey just gets the ball, goes to, it might have been David Barnhill, went bang off his left, beat him and scored this amazing try under the post. And everyone said, oh, that, that, was, that was genius. And I said to Joey after the game, what were you thinking? What were that? And he goes, fuck, I don't know. I just looked up and thought, Barney looks tired. You know, like later on, he became far more strategic. Yeah, how he become really good, Jimmy, was to under he understood his favourite attacking shapes, which he played at Newcastle. He used to call a bulldog, where he would work the ball to a near or a far post. He would have a Blake on his inside. He'd have the short ball and the guy, the fullback just floating around late around the back, whether it be Robbie Davis or Milton Thiday, one, and they just hit the gap. And now that sounds – a lot of guys have that shape now. A lot of them call it a, an arrow or a triple or something like that. One under, one short, one around the back. But Andrew was able to go, is it on for him? Is it on for me? Is it on for the short or is it on the back? And make the correct decision. Mm. A lot of ball players, you can't give them two options or will get confused where he was able to have the four options – wide open and nail the play and make the correct decision yeah. Mate, i want to i want to ask you because you spoke there about some of the influences um the, the coaches and some of the, the the information that they gave you yep how much time were you spending in the backyard it wasn't just playing football like we had All the, the trampoline yeah. mm. we used to soap up the soap yeah. up the ball the handling drills uh mm. bombs in the backyard in a small backyard uh, we had a routine. We'd always come home from school. We'd go um, straight into the backyard and we'd play or we would might go across the road. Across the road's like a, like a tech college, had a big field there. We'd you know, go and play over there. Go over, might be Red Rover crossover, might be, you know, uh, Forsey's backs, whatever it was. We'd do that for a couple of hours. Mum would wrangle us inside to have dinner. Then we'd sit there and watch you know, the goodies or the Kenny Everett video show or something like that. And then, you know, if, if it's daylight saving, out there for another hour and then inside. So everything. So probably three hours a day? Two, three? Abs- yeah, definitely. So what's that? So three hours a day times seven, that's 
21 hours a week. That's almost a day's worth mm. of football, not um, stru- an unstructured extra yep. learning. That's almost one day a week, Yep, 52 weeks a year. That's, f- mm. that's almost, roughly speaking, it's about a seventh of the year. Yes, yeah. And that think, would be at least, Jimmy. And I think with the distractions of things like video games and phones and iPads and tablets, yeah, I think that says a lot mm. because you quickly do the sums and you start to see that you're almost one-seventh of a year. Mm. You do that for seven years. That's a year of your life. So from the age of 7 to 14, it's a one whole year of your life that you've spent doing unstructured football activities Mm. with your brother. Now, that is a real waste of life. (laughs) You could argue that. And and Jimmy, see, and and it's not even the discipline – is but, a, but it wasn't discipline. Yeah, I nah, argue yeah. it was more fun. No, nah, am I but, correct but, in that? No, fun. Absolutely, that's yeah. fun. But I'll tell you what you got, and, and what you got to be careful of too. And coaches, here's the thing: where coaches have got to be careful, is that if I'd have gone into a night system that said, "Forget all that. What we're going to, you have to do this." What they taught us there was principle-based football. So a principle is that, right, we're going to show you how to divide the feel up. If you work there, these are the best shapes. If you decide to go there, that's the best shapes. When the offload comes out, let's think about doing this more. It was never a hard and fast rule. You know, a principle for me in rugby league just led, lends itself to so much um, flexibility. It, it allows your natural instincts and reactive footballers as well as, you know, the guys that like to play, you know, get safety and structure. Uh, it's a little bit like hopping in a car and you go, right, let's go up to the Hunter Valley. And you go, well, there's plenty of ways to go there, but I'll, I'll just go. The, I, I, yeah, we'll get to the same destination. I'll go one way, you go the other, we'll eventually get there. Whereas structured football is putting on a GPS, go left here, bang. Go right here, Jim, boom. Now, if you just do that all the time, every time you jump in a car, you don't ever really develop your own natural bearings. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So if you can, you know, like in the old days, you jumped in a car and someone would go, um, you know, in Sydney and you go, I've got to get there and before you had a GPS, like you you just, you're completely lost but you do it enough, you find your way. And for me... Well, you start to take note of your surroundings. To, no. Yep. And I, I and think... Look, you start to look. That's it. And you start to know. Yes, that's right, Jimmy. And that for me is the difference and and that's where we're all very lucky is the fact that they knew you know, what we did that our whole lives were rugby league because my dad was very well known up around there. And so they knew that. And so if that had brought us in and said, don't worry about all that bullshit, don't do that anymore, don't do that, you know, this is how we want you to play, then all that stuff almost dwindles away. And when you said to me, why, you know, what, what do, what do you see young co- uh, halves struggle with these days, is the fact that I think is that it is being taught structure way too early. Mm. You should be able to have a very basic, simplified game plan which lends itself to natural abilities and players' natural talents, and then when they start to get closer to first grade, then you start to take the edges off a little bit. Yeah. But until that, you just you got to let them go, and you have got to let them make their own errors. Yeah, I, I agree with you. But I think for, for me, the lesson in that is obviously three hours a day is extreme. But in any domain of life, if you do 10, 15 minutes extra every day, mm. the time soon starts to add up. You know, if you're doing ten minutes extra a day of anything, that's over an hour a week, mm. which is over two days of pure hardcore focus on that skill and you quickly find a year mm. that you quickly find that you'll start to excel yeah and be better than others i think about that sometimes about the piano i should have learned 20 years ago mm. who knows what i could have been now should have could have would have yeah i know yeah. guitar bass <laughs> drums bongos rock and roll would have <laughs> suited i uh, i feel um with that combination with your brother um 
obviously it finishes or uh, sorry it shouldn't say finish let me let me skip that out um you very tight knit um how is the current situation oh we're all right yeah, yeah we're all right. right jimmy we always just yeah we have our moments a little bit we sort of drift off sometimes and we eventually get back together again. Mm. And, yeah. and it's peace at the moment? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We've, we've lowered our weapons. Ceasefire? That's all right. It's a ceasefire. Ceasefire. Yes, it's a ceasefire. Mm. So it's all right. We're just mm. we're waiting we're, we're just waiting uh, waiting for the United Nations to come in and can pull all parties mm. to the table. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like a treat. Sign the treaty. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like here's, <laughs> yeah, the, here's yeah. the T's and C's. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> T's and C's can be tricky. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I thought... I can't remember how this conversation came up. I was doing a podcast a couple of days ago and um, there was actually a, a charity match once. Mm. Par- allegedly, folklore has it, that there was the two media companies that are dominant within the NRL landscape. They had a charity match with both with, with journalists from each side of the fence. So now could be a, a 9v Fox. Fox. Could you imagine... Like if they did that for charity, like, and I'm talking presenters, I'm talking journalists, <laughs> I'm talking <laughs> former players. Like if that, yeah. if, if, you know. Buzz, you're an eighth man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we need people like that in. Oh. Like, could, could, can you imagine the, the funds that we, that, that could be raised if that charity match was oh to go God. ahead? Could you imagine? Mate. And Johns v. Johns. Mate, you know, charity right. matches, it's funny, but there's certain sports that lend itself to charity matches. I mean, football. You see all the time, you know, it's Ronaldinho's, mm. you know, the celebration of when he won La Liga with Barcelona and they've brought all of everyone in and they're sort of tapping away and they can play serious because it's not body... You know, there's, there's, they've slowed down a lot, but the touches are still there. It's very good. Rugby league's really problematic, Jimmy, because the nature of the game is... You got to whack someone, or they're going to run out of the top here. Yeah. And a few years ago, Mark Geyer and Triple M did an amazing thing where they had the Queensland floods, and they put a, a state a, a state of origin legends game on New South Wales versus Queensland, right? So it's a Parramatta Stadium, and I'm sitting, I'm watching it on TV and at home, and they cut to the New South Wales shit, and they're all sitting around, right? And they've got their hands behind their back, uh, their heads, and they're laughing and having a good time and they're sort of half interested. Cut to the Queensland sheds, right? And they're all head down. These guys having protein shakes. Oh. And so you had two sides, completely different angles. So in the Queensland sheds, you could say, mate, this is what our, you know, like the state's been put through. Yeah. Well, let's get out there and let's make them proud. And the New South Wales play swimming the game. This will be good. So uh, we're all going to go for a beer after the game. Sure thing. And, mate, it was – you knew things were going to be bad when Terry Lamb – Terry Lamb standing there from the scrum and Wendell just poured onto the ball and just completely ran over the top of him. Mm. One put Brandy went up a short side to ball play. Ball play. One of the Queensland boys hit him late. Right? He ran me the next day and said, you got your Valium. I said, why? I went over there. He'd split. And it forked his tongue, hit him so hard. So all these, all these injuries. That's why you know, like charity games, as far as rugby league is, just so difficult. See, I reckon this is you're selling it to me. <laughs> yeah, like, Jimmy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you're selling oh, it. I reckon. Yeah. You know, could, could you imagine just? Yeah, oh, Jimmy. W- I, Wildler I, and Kent. Oh, can mix. you imagine that? Like, <laughs> oh mate, imagine Buzz. Buzz against who would you? Let me think. Buzz and Gal, mate, they get to Cronulla thing. They get on good. Oh, but some of the, it would it'd be brilliant. It it it, it, w- it would be it would raise yeah. a shit ton of money. There might be a like a horrific there's medical bill at the end of it. Yeah, but there's something in there. Can we do it almost like a decathlon where we start a game as rugby league, then we ah. move over to the wrestling mats, then we go to the boxing ring? <laughs> I like you thinking. Yeah. Like just. Like a bit, a bit, a little bit of everything. Yes, yes. I'm just trying to think of who would I because the boxing. I said I got James Bracey. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever see International King of Sports? No. Mm. That was like a a show in England where they had like strange athletic endeavors, but actual proper athletes did it. So like the backwards hundred meters. Oh yeah. Right. Uh, underwater shot put. 
What? Um, headlong dive. If you've got some time it's on... It's almost full his hair, as that's... It met, it, and it was legit. Like, oh, oh, sorry, well, it was yeah. like a bit of a joke, but Moddy, they had like... Moddy Python. They had right, like yeah. proper athletes doing like the backwards 100 metres. Yeah. And like the long jump, but you had to jump head first. Right. And, there's, and that was the... It, you know how the long <laughs> jump, it's the back. Yes. It was, it was, the, it was the front. So... Um, Mate, well, the... Um, uh, but there's still something in there. I, I reckon there's a. Well, I remember um, there was the world's Australia's greatest athlete. They ran once, uh, two years in a row. Billy won it both years. Billy Slater. Did he? Yeah, he's, he's not surprised. Died. He won everything, mate. Yeah. I, even they did a wall climb, and he was up against Steve Hooker, who was like an Olympic um, high jump. Yeah, high jump champion or pole vault. But anyway, it's got to do with heights. And Jimmy, um, Billy beat him. Like Billy beat everyone. At every at everything, even people's chosen vocation. Oh, really? People would beat him in. He he was he was phenomenal. Hell. So I could see him with the backwards hundred meter sprint. <laughs> I think he'd do quite good. There's so many great stories out of the north of England with rugby league, Jimmy, that you know sort of been forgotten in time. The other one is a fella called is it Frank Burns? Frank Burns. So he was for once a, he he played. Play for Salford in rugby league. Back in the day, Salford, when it was quite a glamorous club in the 60s and early 70s, yeah, at one point it was. <laughs> they had it? the casino. Remember, they had, I think, almost the first casino in northern England and it would sit at the end of the ground. Ah. Anyway, so whenever Salford played and Man U weren't playing, there was like Bobby Charlton and George Best were always up there and, and watching the games. Now, I want to get this right. Uh, I want to get this guy's name right because it's an amazing story. Now, what he did, he did his knee in rugby league and went, um, do you know what? And he and George Best were mates. And he said to George, you know what? I think I want to be a bullfighter. So up until a couple of years ago, he was still bullfighting. Um, when this guy used to play for Salford? Played for Salford. Had, when he was bullfighting at the end, he had two... Titanium knees, but um, <laughs> where did he go for that? Spain. He went to Spain, and he became this legendary. He, he actually became a legend in Spain. Frank Evans. So Frank Evans, right, oh, Jimmy? Francis Frank Evans, British-born matador, most uh, senior form of bullfighting known as El Inglas, uh, the Englishman. Um, and but it said, but he was a Salford Rugby League player. There he goes. Is he still alive? Uh, let me have a look. Uh, born, uh, no death, still alive. Uh, born in Salford, 81 years of age. And Mate, there's a guest. He went to n 1964. Wait a second. He was a, a rugby league player who went across in 1964 and attended training school in Valencia and, and went from there. And George, listen, back in Salford, he began a successful case of speech. He was also an associate, uh, George Best, who at one point was his unofficial manager. How now, about, <laughs> what about right. that for a turn of <laughs> yeah, associate? Yeah. You're an associate. I, 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 do you have anyone that you would consider an associate? I don't know if that's a word I'd use. No. That's a bit, it's, it's. I was tempted it's, to say uh, Brian Fletcher, but <laughs> nah, nah, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, on the um, all, all things Newcastle to to wrap that um, part up, you you win a premiership there. I, I'm assuming that's like the ultimate highlight of your career. But it seemed like it when I've seen the celebrations, it, it meant more to the people in Newcastle oh, than, yeah. than what it would to. Uh, most other cities and towns yeah. up and across the land. Yeah, it was a difficult time for the city. Uh, the BHP had began to shut down. Enormous amount of people laid off there. But also a lot of the coal mines were on strike. Uh, the Rio Tinto mines were on strike. And so right through sort of the most of the final series, my dad was sitting on a picket line, you know, stopping people crossing the picket line with wow. the unions. Yeah, and so there was a lot going on in the city. Um as we started getting closer to the finals, you could feel the momentum starting to pick up. We played Manly at home, drew this enormous crowd. Um, but yeah, it did, Jimmy. It was quite. It was. It was. It was unbelievable. I don't remember. I don't remember anything from when the full time siren went up until when we got on the bus. 
all of it was a complete blur. And I reckon you'd know that from when you won j- during the COVID time mm. with St Helens when you were really emotional full time. But I imagine mm. that next sort of six hours is just, yeah. Trying to remember yes. things. I can remember trying to remember. Yes. It was bizarre at full time. Jimmy, it was bizarre at full time. One thing I do remember is standing on the field and people, there were just Novocastrians jumping on the field and running wild. And they weren't running like streaking as such. Mm. They were running, they were just in this sort of like... Um, Uncontrolled. Uncontrolled, mm. like joy, just mm. running around. And it's, mad, it, what? it's mad, that joy. It, it is, yes. It's, it's, it, it's, it's insane. Well, they were saying, like, it's funny, I, I, I thought for a little bit, you could write a book... I could write a book on people coming up telling me where they were when we won the comp. There was like a guy come up. I've had all sorts of stories. One guy got there and he was in the fire brigade and he just, the fire chief said, everybody get in the truck and they just drove around the city with a siren going. Uh, There was another guy who said he was sitting with his family watching the game and when we won, he literally didn't know. He was having like exploding in himself and just ran into the garage, turned the car on and just left the horn on for two minutes. It was just, there were so many stories like that, but it just, it's, Jimmy, it's a rugby league mad city. You know, it's, um, the whole region is rugby league crazy. It's, it, it's something that only sport can do. Mm. Well, it's interesting you see the 30 for 30 documentaries mm. and why I often – I think a lot of those docos work very well because they're cross – sport is cross-referenced with something that's going on in yeah. society. There's always subplots. And it which really raises the emotion and that's what it was with us. Mm. For us, it was – if you were doing a documentary on our 97 grand final, you would do it simultane- simultaneously. You would tell the stories about the mines and, and the uh, steelworks shutting down or going on strike. Did you mention that when you were – building into the important weeks. Yes, we did. Yep, we did. We we got there, we went. I remember going for dinner one night. Uh, Malcolm really employed a sports psychologist for the side. Uh, he must have arrived and gone, fucking hell, I've got my work cut in here. But he came in, he was really good. He, he trained when Pat Cash, the Australian tennis player, won Wimbledon. It was his, uh, he was his mind coach and he came in and he just give us little tips. He'd just talk to the group. And we remember one night we were sitting there and he was like, you know, guys, why? Why are you going to, why do you want to do this? And we all sort of got to the conclusion. We realised that it was bigger than just us individually and even collectively. It was about the city. And um, that, that was really important. Although I remember one board member there going, ah, oh, fuck that, just win it for yourselves. And we're like, nah, you know. And Chief really drove that hard. Like, you know, mate, we're doing it. We're doing it for the community. Do you think you needed that? I think it... it, Do you think in a parallel universe where Newcastle is... um, The city's a buzz, employment's high, a lot of infrastructure, a lot of hope, Mm. prosperity? Don't know, Jimmy. Maybe. Maybe, but... I, I just I felt that every home game towards the end was starting to become an event and people sort of I'll tell you the other really good year Newcastle had, Jim, and it said, I think it says something about the area and what it does for the football team, was leading into the nineteen ninety season at the back end of eighty nine, Newcastle were hit by this terrible earthquake. A lot of people lost their lives, um, people lost their jobs, um, you know, people losing loved ones, people lost their houses. And I remember what happened is a guy, as the season was just about to start, a guy sent in, an artist sent in a photo and what it was was the city demolished, basically the rubble, and one hand coming out of it and and an arm with the Newcastle Knights Mm. jersey with the red and blue pulling it out. And he said, this is what the, 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 the side should be about. And that year they had an amazing run. And in the top five, uh, back those that was top five, they, they reached a playoff for Balmain to make it into the finals, which was a big, big improvement of what had happened previous. And I think what happened with the earthquake and, and um, I, I think it had emotionally a lot to do with that. Mm. It's amazing what some like tragedy can mm. help you tap into. 
I guess. I think. Like it can yes. tap you into things. You speak about the celebrations, the infamous uh, better than Lego. Mm. Uh, now, I'm not going to ask the, the circumstances or what you meant by that. Yeah. Uh, but what I would like to ask is, I think it showed uh, character, humor, mm. uh, a different side to um, a professional athlete. Yeah. Do you think <laughs> you're we're, reckon, um, <laughs> do you think we're lacking those characters now? I don't know. I don't think so, Jimmy. You I think I, still I, a lot. Do you, yeah. Could you imagine anybody saying that now? Uh, I mean, you didn't drop seven f bombs, so yeah. I, I, I sort of, you know what, I, I, I do, Jimmy. I, I, I reckon I, we went through a we went through a period in the game where the the, the characters were sort of disappearing, or they were few on the ground. I think there's a lot now. Hmm. I think there, I think there's a lot. I, I, it really helps the game. Even like, yeah, you look at guys. Yeah, Brandon Cheese has got his own thing. He's got his own demeanor. Whether people like that or not, you know, build somewhere, you know, because you need heroes and villains. You got Reese Walsh, who incredibly good looking, ultra confident kid, who you know, um, who I imagine like ninety yeah, percent of people love. You got the old cranky old ten percent that go, you know, not in my day, you know, mm. that sort of. Mm. But too pretty. That's right. Mm. Even if guys don't advertly, Jimmy, come out and say certain things or rock boats or anything like that or you know, say anything funny, is their, their characters. You know, like when you run on the field, you know what he's about. Mm. Right? If you sit up in the in the crowd and you it, it's funny, for Vegas, I got a call from the New York Post. The guy they put in touch with me and they said he said, Explain me some of the people on either side. And it was really easy to do. You go, well, Latrell Mitchell's this right now. What he's got going for him is this. Then you got this guy and this guy. Now this guy's a funny guy, you know. But and I found it very easy to explain the characters and things to to watch in them. Where twenty years, you know, fifteen twenty years ago, you'd say you, you didn't really know the players and they were sort of knocked into shape. Mm. Um, so now I, I think there's I, I think there's great characters yeah. in the game at the moment. I think yeah. the game. I've, yeah, I've got to say, Jimmy, as far as the standard of the football, uh, the players individually, the way the teams play, I've never seen the game better. Speaking of characters, when I came to these shores for the very first time as a 15-year-old, mm. I picked up a couple of uh, the best of the footy show DVDs oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. for the decade and then the best of that year, which was 2001. Yep. Um, watch them meticulously because we didn't have anything like that. There was no YouTube. There was no. Yeah. It was and you know, you featured very heavily with a couple of characters. Yes, yeah. um, but not only Re yeah, Reg, Reg, yes. the there was the flight attendant. Yeah, yes, that's um, right. Yeah, do you, do you think they could be? Do you think something like that could happen now? I mean, Fletch, Fletch especially pushes a lot of boundaries. Does. And gets close to that edge. Yeah. Do you think something like that could be? Do by a, were you a current player, or did you just retire? That oh point? no! I, I when I started doing Reg, I was still playing. Yeah. Could that be done now by a current player? Current player, I don't know whether the coaches would give them the leeway to do it. Mm. It'd be like, hey mate, listen, you know, pull, pull your, uh, you know. Pull your head in, you know. You're drawing too much attention. Mm. Focus, to focus away from the team. You're putting pressure on the team, mm. all that stuff. But um, the, pl the the teams I played in, you know, was never, never, never had an issue with it. Could I? Could you do it now? Full stop. Because I get a lot of people saying to me, oh, "Why don't you re uh, bring Reg back?" You just go. I'd say the full cream milk. Reg is not skim milk. Mm. Right? It's you got to take him. Or and you, you don't want to go, okay, I'll bring him back and all of a sudden it's Diet Reg and people going, hang on, like, now you used mm. to be, nah, mm. better let him just drift off into uh And all the, best <laughs> <laughs> all the best characters leave the people wanting more. Yeah. You know, you look at uh, David Brent, Alan Partridge. Yeah. Well, the thing about this too, Jimmy, I'll say this, is that the last, I reckon, 18 months when I was doing it, people were going, enough. Yeah. Yeah, now they go, oh, you know, remember. But they'll, they'll go, that's enough. And I was thinking, this is, this is run its course. Who were your um, comedic influences? Like where did your love of comedy begin? G you know, Jimmy, a lot of, the, you know, we got um, through the ABC back in the day, we got a lot of English TV, uh, the Goodies, Kenny Everett video show. But a lot of those northern, you know, comedies, mm. 
that we, we used to watch. Australia-wise, uh, Norman Gunston. I used to love uh, Gary McDonald and Norman, Norman Gunston, but it was Paul Hogan. There was just – it was, but, but you know, Jimmy, too, you know, growing up in rugby league and you know being around rugby league for most of your life is that the people you meet, like the naturally funny guys. Yeah. And my, my dad, like my father and all his mates – and the guys he coached and the guys he played alongside, they were all just characters. And you had guys that were great storytellers and a real mix. And a lot of time, and, and, and to be honest, that's what who Reg was. The Reg was basically a, a, a gathering of all my dad's mates and hmm. teammates and whatnot and just jam them all together. Yeah. Mm, like that locker room. That's it. Yes. That locker room character. I mean, I'm talking 70s yeah. Hunter Valley Rugby League where it was catch and kill. Mm. I know. That's, mm. that's, that's his that's, influence. That was the, that was the influence. Did, at that point in time, did you have any idea where um, the media career would, uh, would, would end up? It, I'm talking no. about the, the destination of where you are now. No, I, I didn't, Jimmy. There was no, no, no plan. I sort of thought that when I, I, I when I was playing my last few years, I thought, right, I, what I'll do is when I retire, I'll have a couple of years off, then I'll move into coaching. And I was just given an opportunity and it's it's gone gone from there. I've always received a lot of really like people said, was there a plan? Did you plan this and plan that? No. I, the thing about it is I've always received really good uh information for people like you know steve crawley who's the mm. boss at fox he he was one of the original guys that got me at nine and crawls would always go mate too much bullshit pull it in more of this maddie you're doing reg all the time seriously people are going to think you're a fool you've got to come back and you know you've got to actually do some serious commentary you've got to have light and shade so mm. i've been very lucky for, for people that have helped me out and influenced me like that mm. but there, there was no real plan i went in jimmy all in on a rugby league career, yeah. Where did you? Because I did. Because if I didn't make it there, Jimmy, I don't know. I don't know what I would be doing. But it wouldn't be. It wouldn't be good. No, I um, I think there's a lot of people like that that mm. need to have that singular focus. Like I say, that mm. one thing. And if it got, you're all in. It's high risk, incredibly high reward. If it goes tits up, you're mm. fucked. And and if that thing, like I, I in my eyes if you can find something in your life you're ultra ultra passionate about and you're desperate to make it in that is that i think along the way whether you do make it or not if you commit yourself 100 percent, is that all the lessons along the way will put you in good stead for what you do after yeah. that yeah i i think i think there's merit in that mm. i really do um just with your media career obviously you had these characters and now where you are now where did you learn how to think and how to talk and how to communicate? Uh, of course, I've always played in the halves, Jimmy, is that I've always had to be able to communicate, which um, I, I think, again, is a very important thing for halves. If I do stuff with, with young halves, like way back with Cooper at Cronk, not Cooper Johns, a failed footballer. Uh, <laughs> what I do, we just throw out witches hats like they were defenders, and and we just stand there and watch him and say, right, the first defender, second, third, right, you know your shapes you've got to play and what you want to call. Work on your vocabulary, you know. Hear yourself talking, master your sentences, so that in a game when you're under pressure, you're not going, oh, uh, mm, oh gee, uh, uh, you're going, Jimmy. Work to the far post for me. Mm. Right, boys, we've got a pop again coming. Here it comes. It's come. So you can talk under pressure. So I think that moving into the media and, and having been able to structure sentences and, and, and that understand that, that that helps you. But, of course, when you're talking about rugby league, what you've got to do, you've got to take that next step, which is I know what my vocabulary was the Newcastle Knights and what I wanted to do, but now I've got to actually come up with a new set of vocabulary which is going to be able to – that when I say this, the people sitting at home or people I'm coaching with can go, I've got you. Mm. you know, rather than go, right, we're going to go to the B defender and work you – know, you should go, right, second defender off the ruck. You know, 
Ah, Turn a guy underneath. There's a big difference between the B defender. Well, sorry, there's no difference between the B defender and the second defender off the rook. Yep. But I know what you mean with both, but a lot of people wouldn't know what no. you mean with one. No, that's right. And and so often it's so easy for when you retire and even ongoing to go, mate, what he should what he does is he jumped from the B defender to the C defender and but and what he did there, he formed and people would be just going, What the fuck's he talking about? Mm. Where if you can actually come up with a term and you go, right out oh, you get right, right. The, the the guy, uh, the second defender to the right off the play of the ball, or the second defender off the play of the ball. There, you go. Okay, I know who that is. You know, like, it, and that's mm. just a very simply simplistic um, example of some of the things that you've got to let go of when you're a player and then move into the media. Mm. You know, when you're conducting your interviews. Mm. How do you structure it? Do you do you have a plan, a skeleton plan, and and how do you keep it all yeah. intertwined? And how do you think on the go? Like I'm thinking about, you know, perhaps your interview with Craig Johnson, which yeah. was absolutely yeah. phenomenal. Mm. Like, how yeah. do you approach a situation like that? Because you can't just go in and go, "Hey, Craig." Yeah. Well, Jimmy, in Craig's instance, for me, it was, that was easy because he was my hero growing up from the same area. But then that adds an extra, that, yeah. and, and, and extra element of pressure that <gasps> you yes. don't want to get the, <gasps> yeah. the headlights moment. Yeah, that's right. But Jimmy, I knew his story. I knew his life story. So I was, I, I'll, so I was able to go, right, tell us about that. Right, then you go to Middlesbrough. Right. Now... Uh, Graham Souness at, at Middlesbrough. He's very good to you. Yeah. Then now, how do you end up going to Liverpool? You know, if I but if I get a person, it will give me anxiety, Jimmy. Like when I'll get there. So like for instance, a few years ago, I had to do Lauren Jackson, like one of the great, uh, one of the greatest basketballers of all time, um, and she's had an an amazing, unbelievable career. So I'm going down to interview Lauren. And I go, I know her career, but I don't know it like Craig, so I don't know the ins and outs. I'm going to go buy a book. And went, okay. Oh, fuck me. She's won about seven NBA titles, all these achievements. She's gone. She's played in Korea. She's played in China. She's played in Russia. She was on. There were, and at, there was, Jimmy, a multitude of unbelievably interesting stories. And I've got 30 minutes. And you go, right. So in, in that instance where I haven't got unlimited time, Lauren, what we're going to do here, we're not going to tell your life story. Mm. What we're going to do, we're going to talk about your career and we're going to bump all around the place. She goes, yep, no problem. So then I can go, so you played, tell me what it was like. You played in the WNBA for, for Seattle. What sort of city is Seattle? We talk about that. And what I always do, Jimmy, I always make sure that I know where the interview is going next or what the next question is going to be. But what I'll do is, I'll, in my mind, I'll divorce myself away from that and just listen and talk and go, oh, yeah, that's okay, you're righty -o. And then I might go, so you were saying before that you lived on the waterfront there at um, in Seattle. Mate, I stay there once now. There's a Led Zeppelin story. And you go, yeah, and we chat all that and you go, okay, right. -o. Now, when you left there, so you know what I mean? So I, I'll allow for – I'm interviewing you, Jimmy, and you, when you start to talk about something, I'll allow the, the interview to go down a rabbit hole. And, mate, I might go down a rabbit hole for 25 minutes and then we go and we draw back. Yeah, you know, similar. You, you know, it's, it's – Similar to this. Similar to this, exactly. Mm. You go down rabbit holes and you bring it back and, and – and it, but, it's, but the other thing too, which is for me, it, it's a, a discipline and I constantly catch, mis, catch myself doing it, particularly with an audio interview, um, but sometimes with the TV stuff as well, is our natural way that we engage with people, Jimmy, is if you're talking to me, I'll go, wow, yeah, oh yeah, I know, oh yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm sitting at home and I'm either listening to her watching going, shut the fuck yeah. up. You know what I mean? I'm filling the space. Now, if we're sitting at a cafe having a general general chat, that's me engaging with you. Going, fuck, yeah, yeah. Whereas in an interview, it should be just deathly silence. And But if I was doing that at the cafe with you and you're going, Matty, I've got a great story for you, Rob. <laughs> I go and do this and I'm going, 
You're going, he's fucking not into yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> so the, those things are just totally mm. different scenarios of how you should react mm. in, a, in, a, in a conversation. It, it's not natural. Um, how do you find it when you're interviewing someone and you need to go for a piss? I just go for a piss. Right, I'm going. You go, Jimmy. <laughs> you go. Yeah, well, you never know when nature's going to call, and yeah. it's probably been about the last half an hour I've been thinking, <gasps> yeah, I could go, yeah. and then I'm like, oh, do I just... And then I just yeah. I thought the yeah. moment was there. Well, I did uh, I did one recently. Uh, I forget who it was. Was it, was it Dave Warren and, and Dave and Candice? And I just went... I was, I was having a beer, and I went, do you know what? You guys keep talking. I'm just going to go for a piss. So I could hear her, I mean, and they're, and they're just sort of chatting away and they're still answering the question amongst themselves. <laughs> I mean, they're having a squirt. What do you, what do, you do? You've got to go. Well, when you've got to go, you've got to go. Um, interesting, you interviewed uh, the Warners. That's with your new yeah. um, podcast. Yes, backstage with backstage. Cooper and Matty Johns. You bought- so he got preferential. Oh, he got first. He got first. Controversial. Yeah, I know. It's been good. Dave and uh, Candice. Um, we did uh, Nathan Cleary that was interesting. Luke Brooks for the season started. But we did Guy Sebastian the other day and Shannon Knowles, 20 years since that Australian Idol win. So there's been a, a lot of people we've had in the can. It's been it's been really – it's been interesting. Yeah, yeah, so it's not just a football no. focused. It's- no, no, it's, 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 it's broad. Yeah. But, you know, the, the stuff at the start of the year, uh, when we had an opportunity to do Brooksy, Luke Brooks and also Nathan, you can't pass those. No. Right? Yeah. Uh, uh, just quickly, lastly, on yep. the media, because I know we are quite time, tight for time, uh, bringing Fletch and Hindy together. Mm. It, it, was that the, your brainchild? <sighs> I don't know. I think, was a couple, I think there was a couple of us sitting there. And what had happened, we got Hindy on the couch and then I, I look on Super Sad Day and there's Fletch sitting there. And I'm just going, what the fuck is going on here? And I, we just, Colors got together and we said, mate, let's put him on the couch. And, mate, he was brilliant. And then he and Hindy have just formed this comedic combination, which is, it's, it's perfect. Mm. Uh, they're, they're, you know, and the great thing about the show, Jimmy, and I say this to people all the time, on the Sunday and the Thursday show, working with all the boys, we have the best time. Mm. You know, and, and, and that's the thing about the show. I've had people that aren't even rugby league people that watch the show and enjoy the show because they said we, you can see we enjoy each other's company. So, yeah. That's important, isn't it? Really important. And even the Vegas trip we did, the Sin City one, the first one, which I come home on six kilos lighter. My wife was like furious, furious at me. But then she watched it. And don't worry, I was, sitting, I was laying in the bedroom going, oh, fucking hell. I don't know what she's going to think. She came in, she goes, that was so good. Mm, she goes, was. you guys really love each other, don't you? And I said, yeah, we do. Mm. Mm. It's not work. Is it it's really? not work. It's not. It's it, not. It, it can't be classed yeah. as work. How much um, uh, say or, or or influence do you have on, on how the show is? You're, you're not just the front man for the show, I'm assuming. No. You're, you have no. a- I work work hard with the producers and Steve, and they, they'll say to me, you know, about how the show looks and – but I'll, I'll work the producer and say, listen, I think we should get this guy on. Let's have a look at this. Even, you know, talking about, you know, segments and how the segments are structured. Yeah. Mm. It, it goes quick time because the first time that I'd worked sort of full time with the footy show, uh, I started doing stuff in 2002 with them. And I went the other day and I said, 22 years? Fuck me. When that time goes again. Well, actually one the other day, Jimmy, uh, or last year I was watching and there was an old classic game New, uh, the Newcastle Knights versus Great Britain. And when the Britain come out here in 1992 and they played a lot of the club sides. So they cut to the bench and I'm sitting on the bench, right, and I'm watching I'm going, fuck yeah, now. I'll go, that is, that's 20, you know, 21 years ago. God. Then I went, fuck, when, no, hang on, keep going. It's more than that. It was 31 years ago. And I went, what am I now, 52 that's gone that quick and life accelerates as you get older. In the same amount of time which will go and blink of an eye, I'm going to be 83. I'm going, fuck it. Now. Or dad. Who's going to wipe my ass? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> 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 or dead. Probably the latter. One Probably or the other. other. Yeah. You're either going to be 83 yeah. or brown bread. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, you speak about loving each other. You, like, do you get excited for the show? 
Yeah, I do. I still, I so still, that I excited I adrenaline get, hit. Yeah, I, I, you know what? I don't get the so much. Ad, I don't get the adrenaline hit anymore. What I do, I just enjoy it. Mm. It's fun mm. with the boys. I'm waiting to see what they're going to say. Um, that's what it. So you know, you're not getting the adrenaline hit. Like I, I love it, but I'm not nervous and anxious because yeah. you know when you get into something, you're nervous and anxious, and you go home and you go and you just can't sleep. Yeah, yeah. Where now, you know, I'm. I see, I'm, I'm sweet. You yeah. go home and good as gold and get a good night's sleep. Yeah. I, I, I love it, but it doesn't cause me anxiety anymore. With, with those type of um, individuals, do you ever get caught off guard? Like have they ever stumped you and you're like, oh, God, I am gone I, here? I've, ha I've had some times where Fletch will say something and I'll just pause and I'm thinking to myself, oh, fucking hell. What's the right thing to say here? <laughs> and I just go, okay, we'll take a break. Yeah. <laughs> is, that you go, is that your out? I'll or just, we'll just go to a break. If something happens and you're going, geez, that's close to the line, which happens a lot. I mean, I'll say things sometimes to guys. I'll just, rather than try to nurse it or water it, I'll just go, yeah, okay. Now, if we go back to the game and just, just gloss over just it, just let it go. How much of awareness of where that that the line. boundaries are? The line, how much of awareness of where the line slash boundaries? Jimmy, is? if you know where it is all the time, or you're conscious, put it more to the point. If you're conscious that there is a line or somewhere, then you'll be okay. Mm. When you get to the point, and like I imagine some days, Jimmy, because you do a lot of media there, and I reckon your safe day with the media when it's really easy for you is Sunday and Triple M because you got you got Dobbo, mm. you got Gordy there. You probably had a few beers the night four, and you turn yeah. up and you just relaxed and you go, here we go. That is that is the greatest chance that you're going to say something and you just go, oh, fucking hell. Like, yeah, yeah that, uh, that, for me, that's I put it. my foot in the hit, yeah. Yeah, and you get up and you're a bit of a mischievous yeah, mood and yeah, someone's yeah. saying something, you're saying something back, next minute you're flying by the seat of your pants, you know, you're about a kilometre offshore and you go, fucking hell, how did I get here? Yeah. You know, that's, yeah, I, I, I yeah, I, I got to catch myself with that all the time. I'm yeah. excited for a show. This is going to be fun. You know, like the Vegas show is a perfect example. We're buzzing. Mm. We're having a great time in Vegas. What time does the show finish? So we go, yeah, and you go, hang on. We've got to do a show here. You've got to respect the people that are watching and just got to make sure you're, you're professional. Well, well, also, you can you, you can forget yes, that you can. people are in this conversation. Yeah. I'll tell, you one, I'll tell you one of the greatest ones I've ever seen. 88 grand final, right? The last one was at the SCG. David Morrow, the ABC, got fatty on, right, to the pregame. So... They're going, it's Canberra. It's Canberra versus Manly. It's one where Kevin Ward came back for mm. Manly and played that amazing game. Probably should have got Clive Churchill medal. Um, Pre-game and uh, we're joined in the box by, uh, well, uh, uh, a man who was, uh, I think he was playing by that stage. I'm really stuffing this up. It might have been the 88 grand final, I'm sorry, because Fatty was at Manly. So it must have been, it must have been, it must have been the Tigers with Ellery up against the Bulldogs. And they're sitting there and he goes, well, I've got the Manly captain who was part of this fixture last year. And Fatty, how do you think this will go? Fatty goes, well, you know, it, um, um, fuck, oh, fuck, fuck, I don't know. <laughs> David Morrow goes, uh, we just having some difficulty here. We'll just go down to the sideline. And Fatty goes, Oh, we're on, are we? I thought <laughs> we <we're> on. <laughs> it's on YouTube. It's one of the <laughs> He just starts mumbling and he just goes, oh, f fuck, I don't yeah, fuck. It's so good. <laughs> yeah, it's oh, very that's good. brilliant. That is brilliant. Speaking of characters, uh, Brandon Smith um, yeah. often popping into to your place. He's yes. a regular guest on the show, weekly yep. guest. Uh, have you got anything that we can... Sort of put some shit on Brandon. What's he like when he rocks over? Is he, is he does he change? Does he suck up to you or is he just I Brandon? Tell you what he does. He sucks up to my wife beyond <sighs> belief. I'm actually what he does, he always walks in and goes, Maddie, coops, eh, Trish, come no. here. And she loves a cuddle. <laughs> and I always thought, oh, that's so nice. And then I then we did a thing with the show where Steve Philp, who was our warm-up guy, 
with Brandon in the back with the show. And Brandon doesn't know he's been filmed. He goes, oh, mate, you know, you go over to Matty's place quite a bit. Yeah, go over there. Your mates with Coop? Yeah, your mates with Coop. Hey, what about what about, uh, what about about Trish, eh? Not bad. He goes, oh, yeah, she's fucking real hot. And I go, fucking cheeky bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Better that than yeah, mate, you know, the alternative. Do, yeah, yeah, the yeah. alternative. Yeah. Um, mate, we'll wrap the show up like we do uh, for each and every guest uh, the dream spine so no rules around this so you want six, seven, yeah. nine. I've had to think about this at fullback I'll go Billy Slater right. in number nine I'm going to go Cameron Smith in number seven a seven I'm going to go Andrew Johns so who do I play in number six the last thing we need in number six is a person who's going to want to pass the ball around we need a reactive athletic runner of the football so number six I'm going Ellery Hanley ooh so we got wow. We've got Andrew Johns, Ellery Hanley, Billy Slater, and Cameron Smith. I think that'd be they'd be hard to beat. That that is the perfect answer. Um, if football didn't didn't exist, what do you think you would be doing? So you may have gone all in and it didn't work, yeah. or if it just didn't exist, may, oh no, let's go. Yeah. Didn't exist. Yeah. Where do you think you'd be at? I'd be I'd be working in the mines. Mm. Yeah, like a lot of my mates went into the mines, or they went into the steelworks, uh, and. As I said, I think my well, my great grandfather was a miner, uh, grandfather miner, dad's a miner, would have been a miner. Grafting down the mine. The old man, he, when I first started, I think playing for the Knights, and there was a chance you're only playing twenty ones. Will you make it? Will you not? The old man took me down the coal mine, mm. and I think it's a bit of incentive, and said, "This is why you want to make it. But if you don't make it, you don't want to do this." It was it was tough going. Yeah, it's funny you said. I um, my dad's from. A place called Workington, uh, well, oh, Maryport, yeah, yeah. actually, which is a very small area near mm. Workington. Um, he managed to not get out, but he became a school teacher. But I was when I was back once, met up with one of his school friends, and he spoke about being down the pit. Mm. And he said it was the best time of his life. It's interesting. That's interesting because when my dad. They wouldn't let my dad go down the coal mine anymore because of his back and his knees. Mm. And he really struggled for years after it and because he missed the camaraderie of the guys. Yeah. You know, we, we, we were out there, you know, playing rugby league, doing anything I love, but when we retire, you miss the camaraderie mm. of the guys. And but, it's the same yeah. same thing down the mine. They put them, There's a reason they put them with a crew yeah. and they all stick together. They the bloody team. hard work. They put yeah. shit on each other. But he said Tough it was the lead. time yeah. of his life. Well, they used to say about England, you know, like um, England went on as a rugby league, so it was just booming, was you had the steelworks and the mines just booming there. Yeah. And, then, you know, you get, every time you needed a front rower, they yelled down a mine shaft and wanted to come up. You know, blokes like, yeah. I was lucky to be coached, like, you know, through Malcolm Reilly, who's a genuinely tough guy. A bit like you, Gemma, though, don't act, don't act tough. They just naturally tough guys, and through him I met Vince Coralius. Oh, yeah. When we won the '97 Grand Final, Vince was standing in the corner. Of course, for people who don't know, the Wild Bull of the uh, what do they call it, Wild Bull of the Pamplis, but he was regarded as one of the top three tough, toughest players of all time. He just hard, huge hands. You know, typical Northerner. Yeah. Um, give us a sliding doors moment that you think about the alternative happening. I was pl I'd just come into first grade. The side had not been going so good. And I was at a point in my career, you know, you're just not sure of yourself. Mm. Do I really fit in? You know, and I'm looking for something. I'm certainly, I can't almost, in my mind, I can't deal with another disappointment. I'm thinking if I have another disappointment, I might just pull a pin. So we're playing East in New Zealand in a game and – what happens is uh, I get off to quite a good start to the game, set up a couple of tries, but then what's happened is the, my game starts to fall apart. I do an error. Then I push a pass. Then I try to bounce. The ball hits the ground. Meanwhile, Roosters are going try, try, try. Anyway, we lose the game at the end of the game. I find out about a month later, but in the meantime I'd played two or three really strong games and I'm more secure, that they actually had – my replacement, a half of Jason Martin on the sidelines about to replace me and my halves partner got injured and he replaced him. Now I think to myself, wow, if I'd have been 
if I sometimes you, you believe in destiny for that, and you go, if I'd have been replaced, which would have caused me so much embarrassment, I I don't know whether I would have been there the next there training the next Monday. Mm. It's funny how life works like that. Yeah. Um, the most interesting person that you've met along the way. I'm looking forward to this. Right out. The, the most interesting I reckon I met was a, a guy. I listened to a podcast one day. There's a thing you've got to listen to. It's called Big History. Now, I'm listening to it. Uh, it's an American interview. They're interviewing this guy and I'm going, that guy got an Australian accent? Yeah, he has. Then I go, then I'm listening and he, he starts talking about how Bill Gates flies him around the world because what big history is, uh, Gemma, he talks about... He talks about the moment of the Big Bang through to where we are now. And at the conclusion of when he talks through that, and you, you know, and, and, and you read articles he's done, and when he explains it to you, you sit there and you go, fucking hell. It puts perspective into everything. Religious violence. Why? You know, wars. Why? Like we're, little, we're a speck. We're not even a, a, a click in, you know, as far as time in the universe. And that's what you get the end of, get the end of that. But I'm listening to this, and I'm going, he's Australian. I'm wondering, he must live in LA. Then he starts to talk about, oh, I work at Western Sydney University. Then I reach out to him and say, will you come on Triple M? And he goes, yeah, of course. He comes in and says, Matty, I'm a big Tigers fan. I was a Balmain Tigers fan growing up. And, and I'm going, this is fucking unbelievable. And then, you know, like I, I, I'm trying to think of the guy's name who does a lot of the Marvel movies now, um, John Favreau. John Favreau? I was doing a thing and he was talking about when he does one of those big like superhero movies, he'll read some of the stuff from David Christian to get ideas about the universe and stuff like that. So when he explained to me about the universe and I've listened to interviews he that he has done, one of which is big history, type in Conversations ABC, he did with Richard Feidler, it is the most amazing thing that you will ever listen to. Yeah. I want to do that. Yeah, have a listen. I enjoy that sort of stuff. Yeah, David Christian. David Christian. There's a great um, poem. I've got it in my house uh, called The Pale Blue Dot. Mm. And it, you listen to it. It's, it's not, if you look it up on YouTube, basically, we are the pale blue dot. It's the it's a photograph of Earth from like a ridiculously distant, like a ridiculous distance away, and it's just a speck. Mm. And it talks about like on that speck, is everyone you've ever loved, everyone, everyone you've ever ever known, mm. every superstar, every hero, every dictator, and every person you've run into yeah, and yeah. kick off in the grand final. Yeah. Yeah. Every, <laughs> like, th and they say, like, think of the rivers of blood that have been spilt for control of one speck of that dot to dominate over another speck of that dot. It's and it is just, you just go, and it's just us, like, they talk about us being suspended in a sunbeam. No. It's like, that's home. Well, Jimmy, it's the only one. It's and it says that's home, but it's it like it's giving me goosebumps yeah. now. Like talking about it, look, look, fucking mm. like legit, because it is us. But like these things fascinate me. I'm gonna look at that. The, the of all the places to for this, me and my dear mate Brian Carn, the Irishman, we're in Bosnia, right? So I've gone back to the room and I, I'm sitting there. I can't sleep, so I just put on. I, I think it's called Life or something. Anyway, Spielberg's made this doco one. On it, it fuck, I was watching, just going, "This is unbelievable." You know, talking about you go, we always go, "Oh, the dinosaurs, the dinosaurs have almost come." This sort of, you know, mythological thing that you know, but explaining dinosaurs, hundred and fifty million years on Earth, and the longest living, and then you're going, "Fuck yeah, hell!" And you're watching the stuff, and you go, "Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. maybe I won't pay that parking fine." <laughs> <laughs> Mate, you know what you, you spoke earlier about time? Do you know that? The I think it's the the T Rex and like what what's one, another like famous dinosaur Triceratops Triceratops I think it's this I might be getting it wrong the distance between us and the T Rex is shorter than the T Rex and the Triceratops like yeah. they went extinct like the Triceratops went extinct. You'd think that they were those two groups of dinosaurs would be mm. closer together in the time frame. Okay, Jimmy, actually, we better go, mate. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, <laughs> man, I, I, I was gonna, I was gonna ask you about the Big Bang starting yeah. and how determinism works. If you ever go down that rabbit hole, that is messed up. Because can we choose our choice? 
I want to leave you with that question, May. Mm. It's been fascinating. Yeah. Um, I love talking with you. You're one of the most interesting people I've ever met. I've been on uh, some good drinks with you in the past. Mm. Also, we didn't get to bring up Noel Gallagher, but that's fine. But yeah. thank you so much for that. That was a that was experience a yeah. and a half. I was shitting myself, but thank you for yeah. organizing that for me. And my, I know that our listeners are going to love this it's yeah. been football it's been life it's been everything yeah. so thank you so yeah. much for joining us here on the buy round thanks jimmy josh means so <laughs> <laughs> he's a good man josh. he is <laughs> <laughs>